My name's Jacob Strickling and I'm going to be doing this Understanding Electricity course with you. Now, you should have a, a booklet um, with each of the lessons in it and you should have an electricity set similar to this from Tiny Science Lab. Um, you could also probably be using like a normal school's um, power packs and lights and that sort of thing. Uh, but this is the best set to accompany uh, this particular course because it's got everything that you'll need. So we're going to be um, looking at energy and looking at appliances, looking at electricity, how it flows, um, power, voltage, current, um, series circuits, parallel circuits, work, um, all sorts of things. So strap yourselves in and let's start the first lesson Understanding Electricity, Lesson 1, Energy and Appliances. So what is energy? Well, energy is anything that causes change. Energy is anything that causes change. Now, I learnt that in Year 7 when I was 13 years old. And I taught school science for um, <clears throat> 26 years. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, and I can assure you that that definition has been good enough for me. So it's probably going to be good enough for you too. Energy is anything that causes change. Now there's nine forms of energy, and without further ado, we're going to explore them. So let's start with the first one, light. So of course we're going to need a light globe. So grab um, your light globe holder, one of your little light globes, and screw it clockwise into the um, holder. Clockwise or to the right, um, righty tighty, lefty loosey. So whoa, <laughs> clockwise, in we go. So that's how you get your light globe ready. You're going to need one of your battery packs. Now, these battery packs take AA batteries, which are 1.5 volts, and the flat end is the negative end, and it goes against the spring. So you push the flat end against the spring, and the knobbly end, with the little knob on it there, that goes against the sort of flat part. The knobbly bit is the positive part. Now if you look carefully, you should be able to see like a picture of the, the battery, or the cell, and that shows you also how to pop it in. So we can put the little lid on, and I think the best thing to do is probably just grab um, two connectors. I'm just going to use the, the threeers, because uh, they've got one, two, three terminals, and do a direct connection from the battery pack to the light globe, and look at that. We have got light. Yay, light. Light is a form of energy. It causes change. What sort of change does it cause? Well, light from the sun helps, uh, well, that doesn't help it, it allows plants to grow. Uh, light from this bulb, well, the photons shoot off, hit something, and then they reflect, come into my eyes, and I'm allowed, I can see them, I can see things. So light allows us to see things. Well, that's a change, isn't it? You know, if it's completely dark and I turn the light on, well, then I can see things, that's a change. So energy is anything that for, uh, causes change, and this light definitely causes change. Now, is there anything else in this set that will produce light? Absolutely. Uh, number 17, the red LED produces light. Now, it's a little bit different, and that is that it's important, if you want this to work, you've actually got to connect it um, with the correct polarity. So the positive side has to be where that little plus symbol is. See that little plus symbol? That's that's positive. And so make sure on your um, battery pack where it says positive, you connect that to the positive side of the light emitting diode. L-E-D. LED. And whoa! Look at that. <laughs> We've got a nice bright red light. Now, if you pop that up your nose, not too far of course, uh, you look a little bit like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And I did that once in um, Janolan Caves. And they kicked me out. 
Uh, they said I was disrupting the um, tour. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have been singing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer at the time, but anyway. Beautiful, glowing red light. Now, if you don't believe me about that polarity stuff, try turning the um, LED around and it doesn't go on. Now, don't say it doesn't work. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. It only allows the electricity to go in one direction. So, pop it that way, it works. <laughs> pop it that way. <gasps> I don't want to say it doesn't work. I'll say the light doesn't go on. But notice with the... Um, incandescent globe, incandescent globe, it actually doesn't matter which way the electricity is flowing, it will still go on. So you can write down light, okay, you can write down light there as a form of energy, and we've still got the light globe. Um, what we're going to do is put a bit more or a higher voltage across it. So you can get your second power pack and with a tour, with a tour, so one of the two connectors, connect the two power packs together like this in series. Okay, so they're actually connected in series. And let's see if I can connect that light globe again. Let's have a little look. Oh, whoa! That's a lot more, well, a lot brighter light, isn't it? Okay, there's a lot more energy coming out of that light. Very, very bright. Probably don't want to have it on for too long because you might blow your light globe and then you'll have to um, use a spare. But the reason that I want you to look at that is that if you sort of put that, oh, careful. Oh, it's nice and warm. It's producing a lot of warmth. It's producing a lot of heat. Heat is a form of energy. Heat causes change. Ah, lovely. Heat causes change. Now, <laughs> don't put your LED with six volts with the with the two power packs because you'll blow it. So don't do that. That's designed for just one power pack. If you don't believe me, well, you're going to end up with a piece of broken equipment. So don't do that. So another form of energy is heat and heat causes change. And I'm going to do a little experiment to show you that heat causes change. Now, it's very good practice just to keep your work area tidy. And so um, try and keep things packed away in their, in their um, proper place. And that way everyone will stay happy. <laughs> so let's pop that there. And I've got a piece of timber here. It's got a black surface on it. And I've got a liquid here. It's a clear colourless liquid. And it's, it's actually the chemical that has caused the most injuries in schools, believe it or not. It's very common. It's not petrol. Don't ever play with petrol, whatever you do. But I'm going to light one end. Now, you time how long it takes for the fire to travel from one end to the other. Are you ready? Boom. Yeah, one and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight. Quite slowly, really. Nine and ten and eleven and twelve. So let's say 13 seconds. And that chemical reaction is producing heat and light. I can feel the heat. We can see the light. Now, what change does the heat cause? Well, now this surface is quite hot. And I'm going to repeat this. Okay, I'm going to repeat the same little thing. So I've got the same amount of fuel, same amount of fuel, and I'm going to light it. Remember the last time, it took 13 seconds. Let's time it this time. Ready, set, go. Whoa! That was like two seconds. The heat produced, well, a very visible change. It caused the chemical reaction to go much, much faster. So, heat is a form of energy. So you can write down heat, and that's a form of energy. Next one. Ah, the motor and the fan. So let's get the motor and the fan out. Very, very good. And here's our, our fan, and this is our motor. Now, a motor 
converts electrical energy or transforms electrical energy into moving energy or kinetic energy. So let's get our motor there and a battery pack. And you know what? It's probably best to put in a switch in this case. So this is called a momentary switch or a push button switch. This is number 14. Click, 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 click. And let's connect him in with just, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use tours like this and come around and looks like about a four will do this. Lovely. And when I press the button, the motor starts spinning. Kinetic energy, kinetic energy. And I'm going to get my fan and I'm going to place it on to the motor and start spinning. Hmm. That's about all it's doing though. It's just spinning. Oh, you know what I need to do? You know what I need to do? I'm going to try turning the motor around. And that will cause it to spin in the other direction. And I might have a bit more success with what I'm hoping it to do. So let's see. No, I'm not having any more success. Woo! Let's have a closer look. What's the problem? I want this to fly. Fly, fly, fly away. Let me have a look, see what way it's going. Oh, well, I think I had it right the first time, you know. The way that it's spinning now, I can see that it's going to be pushing air up and air will push it down. So I'm gonna turn it around again. I'm very sorry about this, taking up your time. But we're exploring, exploring science. So it's not really a waste of time, is it? Let's try that. Whoa! Oh, a little bit of flight. Not much. You're probably like sitting at home or at school and it's flying away, no problems at all. Whee! That was better. <laughs> oh. Now what the fan is doing is it's pushing the air down. It's pushing the air down, and according to Newton's law, if the fan, Newton's third law, if the fan pushes, pushes the air down, then the air pushes the fan blade up, and that's what causes it to take off. Woo! Whoa! Has yours been flying all over the place? Now, it doesn't go very high, does it? A little bit disappointing. Do you think there's a way that we can make it go higher? Remember what we did with the light globe to make it brighter? We got two power packs and we put them in series. So I'm going to get the two power packs and put them in series. Um, that means it goes like negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. All right, that's in series. They're all sort of, the batteries are all sort of all joined together to give six volts. And so let's connect them up. And they are now in series. Let's pop the connector on. Yes, that sounds terrific. And are we ready? Set. Woo! Whoa, <laughs> that was a lucky catch. <laughs> that went so much higher. Mine touched the ceiling. Wow. Woo! <laughs> so when it goes up, when this fan goes up, it's actually getting a new form of energy. It's actually getting something called gravitational potential energy. Now, are we ready? I'll do it again. Gravitational, woo, <laughs> potential energy. So, the kinetic energy from the motor, right, is causing the fan to spin, and that kinetic energy gets changed into gravitational potential energy. So, for example, if I have this box of matches, it doesn't have much gravitational potential energy there, but if I uh, lift it up, if I do work on it, now it's got gravitational potential energy. If I let go, oh, the gravitational potential energy is changed into kinetic energy. So on your sheets, on your sheets, um, when the fan goes up, that's called gravitational potential energy. And potential is like stored energy. You know, if it's, if it's up here, it's like stored energy. And you might've heard of like hydroelectricity. Well, that depends on the stored 
um, weight of the water um, up high. And then you can let that water flow through a pipe. The gravitational potential energy changes to kinetic energy and you can generate electricity so it changes to electrical energy. And the, um, the motor itself, kinetic energy, kinetic energy. Um, that, that word uh, is like comes from the word the same word as cinema, cinema, which is moving pictures. Okay, moving pictures is the cinema or the theater. Okay, let's go to the the battery pack itself. And so, hmm, what sort of energy? Notice that I'm cleaning up. Good, good, good teacher, cleaning up as you go along, setting a good example for you to keep your work area nice and tidy, nice and clean. And so, the next one we're looking at is, well, it's actually the batteries. It's actually the batteries. What type of energy does the batteries have? Well, it's a stored energy. It's a stored energy. And it's, it's based, it's got chemicals inside it, okay? It's got a bunch of chemicals, goopy chemicals. And those chemicals um, can change into electricity. Well, the chemical reaction can produce um, electricity. And so it's actually chemical potential energy. Chemical potential energy. I'm gonna show you some more chemical potential energy with my, oh, tiny science lab um, chemistry set. A little bit of product placement here. Um, oh, doesn't quite have everything in it because rah, the table. Look at that. So the tiny science lab chemistry set, and I'm going to show you some chemical potential energy in this Bunsen burner. There's a chemical there. Now that is not a that is not water, even though it's a clear colored liquid. It turns into gas. It's not the same liquid that I used before. It's actually butane, butane. And if I pop um, the heat proof mat on and I get some matches, oh, matches have got chemical potential energy. It's a stored energy. And if I light, or oh, if I attempt to, <laughs> if I, oh yeah, there we go. I light the match and the chemical potential energy is being changed into heat and light. Turn on the gas. And blow that one out. The chemical potential energy of the butane is being changed into heat. Woo! And whoa! And light. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> so, chemical potential energy is the energy which is stored in chemicals, which can, and the energy can later on be released. So, let's pop him away. And. We might do a little bit more with that one later on. And so here where the batteries are, right, chemical potential. And then of course, of course, we've talked about electricity. I mean, this whole course is about electricity and electri electricity causes wonderful changes. And so electricity um, goes in this uh, little box down there. Now that brings us to the mousetrap. Bum, ba -da -dum, bum. Here's a mouse trap. Now, I don't think many kids actually see mouse traps these days, or have maybe even heard of them. I guess they're a little bit cruel. Um, but the idea, if you've got like a bit of a mouse problem and it's coming and nibbling your food and pooing all over your place, then what you do is you put this trap out at night time, but you have to set it first. Now, to set it, I have to pull this bar back pull this bar back and then put the little latch on now when the latch is on see that you have a bit of cheese or some peanut butter there because when the little mousey comes to peck at the cheese it presses that like lever and then that that thing will get that bar will get released now do you want me to do it with my finger i'm not stupid i'm gonna do it with the the match <laughs> Oh, that's a, that's a lot of energy. Didn't quite break the match, but boy, it certainly scared me, that's for sure. So 
when I when I pull back on the spring, that's potential, well, elastic, elastic potential energy. It's like elasticity. Okay, so when I'm pulling back on the spring and I wind the spring up, that's elastic potential energy. Um, I'm not gonna do it with my finger. I really don't. Oh, I really don't like mouse traps very much at all. Um, but this, this is called a metronome. And if you play the piano, you might know what a metronome is. But you have to wind up the metronome. You have to give it elastic potential energy. And when it's got elastic potential energy, that elastic potential energy can get changed into kinetic energy and sound. And this is how you, you can okay, you time your piano playing to this, you know, to get the right tempo. Uh, if you want to speed up the tempo, you slide that down. Whoa, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. If you want to slow the tempo down, you slide, oh, slow the tempo down. <laughs> anyway, metronome, metronome. Wonderful things. And so that is elastic potential energy. Right there, elastic potential energy. And under it is the loudspeaker. Okay, the loudspeaker, which is this little unit here. Now, later on, we're going to use this to um, play happy birthday. But for now, we're just going to get it to make a little bit of noise. So you'll need the battery pack. And I think what's best, what's best is if you get the two alligator clip leads out, Now they're called alligator clips because they're, they're, the end looks like crocodile mouths. Now to use these, you have to squeeze that and then that will open up there. Ow! Oh, careful that you don't like grab your finger with them because they're, they're like quite, they've got sharp little teeth on them, right? So if we connect one to the battery pack to there and one to the battery pack to here. Now, it's not a great idea to just put the wires together. That actually creates what's called a short circuit and a lot, a lot of electricity will flow and it will empty your batteries very quick. Now, don't be a naughty young person and don't do that to flatten the batteries, okay? Because that's not very nice at all. Um, I've just reached into the electricity set. I've just reached into the electricity set and this particular set has got some graphite rods graphite rods. Now they're very brittle, so they will break if you exert a force on them, um, but they're quite cheap to get, so it's not a disaster if you break them. Now, I have made a little bit of a boo-boo, and that is that I don't connect, I only connect one of the wires to the battery, and then I get a connector, and I connect from the battery to the loudspeaker, so from the battery to the loudspeaker, and then to the next alligator clip and then this alligator clip goes back to the battery. And if I now put the alligator clips together, I get a scratching noise. You can hear the loudspeaker. The loudspeaker is changing electricity into sound. Electricity into sound. And if I want, I can grab uh, the um, graphite rod in each of the alligator clips Ooh. and I can rub them together. That's actually showing that the graphite rods are electrically conductive. See? Ooh. They actually are electrically conductive. Is that nice? Well, you're probably like, no, that's not nice. <laughs> Fair enough. It's not very nice at all, is it? But that loudspeaker produces sound and sound is a form of energy. Sound causes change. Now the final one is a uh, like a nuclear or atomic symbol, and nuclear energy is the final one. Now I couldn't I couldn't include like a, a nuclear reactor in your um, electricity sets, um, but around your house there there probably hopefully are some smoke detectors, and believe it or not, but they actually have the tiniest tiniest little bit of radioactive material called a americium. I think one two one, but you can fact check me on that one. Uh, there was a kid in the United States a few years ago, he went to Walmart 
um, every Walmart. He bought hundreds and hundreds of these smoke detectors and he pulled them all apart and he put all, pulled all the little bits of radioactive um, americium out and he had a whole like bundle. Anyway, an overhead satellite, I think of the FBI or CIA or something, actually detected a hot spot. And so he actually got like raided by the SWAT team and um, arrested for, you know, trying to put together some type of, I think he wanted to make a ray gun. Yeah, ray gun. Hmm. Okay. I was going to say in, in America. But yes, yeah, so let's, don't, don't, don't go and buy a whole bunch of smoke detectors. Radioactivity is actually very dangerous. Um, you can't see it. It's invisible, but it kills tissue. It kills, it kills tissues. It kills cells and it mutates cells. So you do want to stay away from radioactivity. Okay. Yeah. hundred percent. Now we're going to go on a little incursion and we're going to have a look at a number of different electrical appliances, uh, around the house and look at their power rating and some of the energy changes that they do. So come on, let's um, go for a little incursion. <laughs> See you soon. Okay, well, we're gonna start with the biggest appliance first of all, and that's the hot water system. Now the hot water system changes electricity into heat. Electricity into heat. Hot water, actually. And um, it uses a lot of power. It uses a lot of energy. In fact, its power in watts is 4,800 watts or 4,800 joules of energy every single second. Now, it's probably only going to be on for a few hours per day, but it produces hot water for all your hot water taps, for your hot showers, um, for, for washing the dishes, that sort of thing. Now, it's actually not a great use of energy because if you have a look in a moment, it's actually a hot day out here and there's a better way to produce, to, produce, <laughs> to produce your hot water. Let's go and have a look. This, this is a much better way to make your hot water. Instead of using electricity, we're using the heat from the sun. Now my hot water system is just around the corner and it pumps cold water to the bottom of this and then the cold water is pushed up through the copper pipes and it absorbs the heat from the sun and it actually comes out the top quite hot. This is a, a solar hot water system is a great way to save electricity at home. It's probably even better than generating electricity using solar panels. But hot water systems, solar hot water systems, fantastic. Okay, let's go to the next appliance. So your next appliance is very similar to that hot water system. It's a kettle. It changes <laughs> electricity into heat. Electricity into heat. And it's not nearly, well, it's actually quite powerful. If we have a look at the base, it's quite difficult to see, but there's a number that says 240 volts. Well, in Australia, all your plant appliances that you plug into to the wall will be 240 volts, but they will have different power ratings. And the power rating of this kettle is 2000 watts, 2000 watts. It converts 2000 joules of electricity into heat every single second. Now that's a lot of energy, but thankfully the kettle doesn't have to be long. Well, doesn't have to be turned on for long to like heat up your hot water. So it's not too bad in terms of electrical usage. A really bad device that your parents probably hate is this thing. It's a, what do we call it? A blow heater. And um, it's very powerful. It uses electricity, again, to produce heat, but it heats up the air, heats up the cold air. And it uses, let me tell you, every appliance will have a sticker somewhere on it, like this, and it will tell you what the energy usage is. And in this case, it goes up to 2,400 watts. So 2,400 joules um, of energy per second, which is the same as the kettle. But the thing is, most people leave this on for 
well, for hours, basically. And if it's using 2,400 watts, it could literally be costing mm, maybe a dollar an hour to run. That expensive. It could cost a dollar an hour. So if you leave this on, you know, for six hours of the night, could, just to run this thing, cost your parents six dollars. And I can tell you that will add up. There's more efficient ways to heat a house. Probably a reverse cycle look at air conditioner is probably um, better than using one of these. Okay, let's go to um, the next energy uh, user or next appliance that uses about 25% of the household's power. And in a way it does something with heat. I wonder if you can guess what it is. It's the refrigerator. A refrigerator pumps hot air out of the fridge. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, out of the fridge. Well, from the inside of the fridge to outside the fridge. That's what the compressor does. It, it, it sort of um, works in a way to pump the hot air out. It moves the hot air out, leaving the fridge cold. And it probably uses, I'm going to guess because I can't see the sticker, but when it's on, it's probably using about um, 300 watts or 300 joules per second. And it turns, it basically turns electricity mm, into heat. Uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but outside the fridge is actually quite hot um, because it's taking the heat from inside and pumping it outside. Because the thing about energy is that you can neither create it nor destroy it, but you can change it from one form to another. So you can't destroy heat energy, but you can you can move it somewhere else, and that's exactly what a fridge does. Uh, everybody's favorite, the television. Um, a television changes electrical energy into light and sound, and this TV, um, I've had a look on the back, it uses about 250 watts, or 250 joules per second. So that's about, that's about one-tenth of this blow heater. So, you know, it uses 10 times less energy than a blow heater, uh, which is why most people don't mind having it on uh, for too long because it actually doesn't use a terrible amount of energy. But it does make your eyes square. So just be careful if you watch too much of this thing, all right? Don't want to get square eyes, do you? Mm -mm. Okay, well, here's an unusual electrical appliance found around the house a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. It's got two powerful electric motors that when they're operating will draw, are you ready for it? 20,000 watts or 20,000 joules per second. That's like five times the power draw of a big hot water system. And that's why it's got a very big battery, a 10 kilowatt hour battery. Well, when I say big, it's not that big. I mean, a Tesla's battery is five times as much. Um, but this battery, it will run the car for half an hour. And then when the, the car has run out of battery, then it's got a petrol engine that kicks in and generates electricity to run it. Um, electric cars are going to become much more uh, common in the future. Because one of the beauties of it is I can use my solar panels, my electric solar panels, to charge the car up. And so that means we don't actually have to pay very much petrol cost at all. Um, great car, this one. <laughs> uh, so this is where I work. Um, it's the Tiny Science Lab headquarters and we're looking at the lights. Now each of those lights, they're LED lights, they're very energy efficient and they use 40 watts or 40 joules per second and they give out quite a lot of light. Um, not very much heat at all. They convert most of the electricity into light plus a little tiny bit of heat. Now talking about heat, come and have a look at my 3D printer. So we've got a few 3D printers um, and this 3D printer is producing the um, ammeters. Uh, found in your electricity sets and the printer 
changes electricity into heat to melt the PLA plastic and into kinetic energy to move the head and the base around. And it uses a very small amount of energy, about 40 watts, 40, um, 40 joules per second. So it doesn't cost a lot of energy to run. And you, you may be interested, but here is the uh, packing station for the electricity sets. Uh, we make the foam and we um, print out the ammeters and the voltmeters and the, uh, use the laser cutters to make the switches and the motors and that sort of thing. And uh, this is the packing station where we um, fill up the sets and send them out. <laughs> How good's that? So I hope you enjoyed that little trip around my house looking at the different um, electrical appliances. You should definitely find a few appliances for yourself and find the sticker. So for example, a hairdryer. Um, a hairdryer turns electricity to heat and kinetic energy and sound. Um, and it uses quite a lot of energy, so it should be up in the 1500 watt region. What about maybe a uh, food processor? You should be able to find the, the sticker on it that says how much electrical energy it draws. I'm guessing it will be about 400 joules per second or up to 1,000, something like that. A vacuum cleaner, it will use a fair amount of energy. The good thing is it doesn't have to be on for long either. Now, a very key thing, which I didn't mention before, but I'll mention now, is that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be changed from one form to another. And that's the first law of conservation of energy. You cannot destroy energy, you cannot create energy, but you can change it from one form to another. Now, electrical energy costs money. It costs money to produce it, costs money to um, send it through the wires and to maintain those wires. And so electricity is actually fairly expensive. You probably heard your parents complain when they get the bill. What? They run around the house and they turn off all the lights. Turn the heater off, put on a jumper. Um, turn, you know, stop wasting electricity. I'm sure you've heard that before. <laughs> so what are some things you can do to save electricity around the house? Well, easy, there's some easy things. You can turn off lights when um, you're not in the room. That's a good one. Um, you can close doors, to, especially in winter time, you can close doors to keep the heat in certain parts of the house. So during you know, a cold afternoon or something, if, if people are um, out in the living room and no one's in their bedrooms, then we close the doors to the bedrooms and we don't heat the bedrooms. We just heat where the people are, otherwise, Hey, you're just wasting energy heating places which don't need any heating. Uh, under all our doors, we've got these little rubber strips and those rubber strips stop the hot air from leaving throughout under the doors. And so it sort of like helps insulate the house. Uh, talking about the house, we've got uh, fairly thick, um, it's called aerated concrete walls, but you can use insulation. You can use insulation to stop the heat from leaving in winter, or in summer, you can stop the heat from coming into the house. Um, you can change lights from uh, incandescent lights, which are like these, to LED lights. Uh, that's a much more efficient way to use energy. Um, what else? Don't leave your fridge door open, right? Because then all the, uh, the heat from the house goes into the fridge and then, yeah, the fridge has to pump all that heat back out again. So keep the fridge door as um, closed as, as much as possible. Don't just like have it open when you bring out the milk and then the orange juice and then close. No, keep it open, grab it, close it. Small things like that. So there's lots of websites that you can visit to see how to save electricity around the home. And every little bit helps it and I'm sure your parents will appreciate it. And a great thing to do would be to actually make a savings, um, saving energy um, poster. Because every little bit of energy or electricity you save, not only does that reduce the power bill, but that means the power companies don't actually have to make that electricity. And 
Uh, some of them are like burning coal to make the electricity. And so um, that's not great for the environment, is it? So saving electricity is not just great uh, for reducing electricity bills. It's also great for um, saving the environment. All right, so that was lesson one, energy and appliances. I hope that you've learned a few things and I'll see you again soon. Okay, lesson two, conductors and insulators. So conductors allow the flow of electric current through them and basically insulators do not allow electricity to flow through them. So we can make a little circuit to test whether something is conductive or not. You'll need your um, power pack, uh, three volt power pack because it's two times one and a half volts and a light globe is pretty good as well to be honest so let's do a light globe and let's connect him in series i'm not going to bother with a switch don't need a switch um and your two alligator clips like so and we'll pop him there like that very straightforward because if we touch those two alligator clips together we get um, current flowing and we can see current flowing through the light globe. So if something's conductive, so for example, I've got a stainless steel ruler here and I click the stainless steel ruler to, stainless steel ruler to one alligator clip. Oh, look at that. The um, ruler is conductive because it allows electricity to flow through it. Now, it's often important to draw the electric circuit. Now, we don't like just draw a pretty picture of it, okay? We actually use symbols to represent the circuit. Now, I'm gonna go old school, because I reckon the best school is the old school. I'm going to draw the conductivity test circuit on this little whiteboard. So let's start with the, the battery pack. And we've got a long arm there, so we use symbols a short little bar. Now that's a 1.5 volt battery. And we've got two batteries. So there we go, I've just drawn two batteries in series. I've got a connector that I draw with a little line like that. And that goes to the light globe, which I put a circle and a cross through. That's the symbol for a light globe. Then I come from the light globe to my alligator clips and so I'm going to sort of do like a little alligator mouth like that and then from this side of the battery I come and do an alligator mouth as well like that there we go so that essentially is the circuit um, now it's best to use a ruler for for those lines not like dodgy hand-drawn sort of things, but <laughs> if you can use a ruler, even better. That's the simple circuit diagram. So, let's pop that here, and we're going to do a little experiment. And there's a table there ready to complete. And so I've got uh, the table here, and the first object we're going to do is a plastic spoon. So I'll just put a spoon, and it's made, well, here's the spoon. <laughs> it's a plastic spoon. And I bet you already know whether it's going to be conductive or not. But we might as well just test it. May surprise us. Connect the spoon and no. No light. Um, it is not conductive. Okay, not conductive at all. So conductivity, not at all. Zero, zero conductivity. Well, according to that light globe. Uh, so, no, no conductivity. What's next? Oh, let's, how about we try a paper clip? Okay, so I've got a paper clip. Now, you might be testing some of your own things. I'm sure you will be. You've gone and found five objects, um, or you can pause the video and head off and get them. 
But let's put the paperclip into the circuit. Way! And we have got good conductivity. Okay, good conductivity. Now, what do you think the paperclip, the material is? It's a, it's a type of metal. I think it's just like iron. Um, but the fact that it's not rusty means it might even be like a stainless steel. I'm not 100% sure. But I know it's a paperclip. And it's made out of some type of metal. I'm going to guess... Oh, I'm oh, no, steel. I'll just put steel. And definitely conductive. Okay? In fact, all metals are conductive. That's one of the properties that makes metal metal. The fact that it's actually conductive. Now I've got a dowel. Okay, dowel. D-O-W-E-L. And that's like a circular prism of wood. Okay, a dowel is a circular prism of wood. And if I connect him up there like that, um, no light. Because wood is a bad conductor, but a good insulator. So plastic is a bad conductor of electricity, but a good insulator of electricity. So we've got the dowel, D-O-W-E-L. And it's made out of wood. And no, no conductivity because it's a very good insulator. Okay, next. Oh, I've got a whirly twirly piece of something. I wonder if you know what this is. Hmm, I can bend it with force. Can I can bend it with force? I'll say it's a it's a it's a tube. Okay, it's a it's a tube. Do you know what? Uh, it's made out of metal. Do you know what metal that is? Copper. Okay, copper. And what do you think? Do you think copper's a good conductor or a good insulator? Let's connect the alligator clip to one end and the other alligator clip to this end. Way! Look at that. It's a very good conductor. Copper is an excellent conductor. That's why they make wires from copper because it's such a good conductor so that's a, a tube okay that's a tube and t-u-b-e and it's made from copper the symbol for copper is c-u and a big yes it's a good conductor a very poor insulator now the next one i'm going to test it's not so much a um hmm, there's some liquid in that i think it's water Okay, um, the next one I'm going to test is not so much an object, but more of a substance. Hmm. It's a clear, colourless liquid. It's a clear, colourless liquid. And it's sulfuric acid. Okay, it's sulfuric acid. Now, what do you think? Do you think it's conductive or not? Conductive or not? Now, I'm not going to dip my alligator clips in there. What I am going to do is I'm going to get these um, graphite rods from out of my set and I'm going to connect them to oh connect them to the alligator clips. Now the graphite rods are conductive. We saw that we saw that last lesson. Oh not very conductive though. Okay they're not they're not super conductive that's for sure. They're only mildly conductive. Okay, uh, there are one of the only substances that is non-metallic that is conductive, very faintly conductive. Okay, very faintly, uh, not that conductive at all. I might just pop it in the, the sulfuric acid. What? Mm. Okay, okay. I'm gonna have to change how I'm doing this. I'm actually going to get the bolt, the ammeter out. Have you got an ammeter? It's got a big A and it measures current. And instead of the light globe, I'm going to use the ammeter because that is more likely to give me a result if it's conducting electricity. Okay, so let's have a look this time. All right, now I'll put that towards there so that you can see any movement. And now when I touch the 
uh, carbon rods together, you can see that there is some conductivity going on. Okay, you can see the needle move just a little bit, but definitely conducting. Now, what about if I put it in the shelf? Oh, look at that! Oh, yeah, the sulfuric acid conducts electricity. Can you see the little tiny movement there? Okay, the sulfuric acid conducts electricity. In fact, it's bubbling as well. Um, my guess is it's producing oxygen gas and possibly hydrogen gas as well. Uh, that's for chemistry. So, okay, so the object, the object in this case, oh, what should I call the object? I'm just gonna call it a liquid. Okay, I'm gonna call the object liquid, but the material is sulfuric acid, which is actually quite dangerous. Is it conductive? Yes. Okay, so look at that. That's my table completed. But you should do your own objects from around the house. Not just rely on my results, but definitely do your own experiment. Now, the worksheet says conductors. Well, conductors, well, um, conductors are objects that allow electricity to pass through them freely. Insulators are objects or substances that do not allow electricity to pass through them. And discussion, basically, metallic objects, objects made from metals, are conductors. And basically, objects made from non-metals are insulators. Now, some liquids, like acids, uh, vinegar, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, Salts, salty water, okay, they're good conductors of electricity. Um, but pure water is actually not. So metals are conductors, and basically most non-metals are not. Unless, of course, you're graphite made out of carbon, and then you conduct electricity. So we're going to do an experiment now, okay, an experiment. And the experiment is, it's an electricity experiment, surprise, surprise, resistance and length. Resistance and length. Now, resistance has to do with conductivity. The less resistant, the greater a conductor you are. The more resistant, the greater an insulator you are. So metals are not very resistant, okay? But something like plastic has a, has a lot of resistance. Glass has a lot of, electric, a lot of resistance to electrical flow. Glass, clay, uh, ceramics. They're all great insulators and so have a lot of resistance to the flow of electricity. And the aim is to determine the relationship, how one thing compares to another, um, between the length of a conductor, the length of a conductor and its resistance. So we're gonna do a little experiment to see how the length of a conductor affects the flow of electricity. Um, and so we need to set up the following equipment. Well, I've basically set it up already. I've <laughs> in, but in this case, I'm actually gonna get six volts. So let's do six volts. So to get six volts, <clears throat> we get two battery packs and we put them in series. So I connect the two battery packs in series and I'm just gonna put some equipment away to keep things nice and tidy. Then my ammeter, gets connected to the battery pack. Now the, the black wire basically should be connected to the negative component or the negative bar there. And then the red part of the ammeter, the red part of the ammeter can go to, now this might sound a bit confusing, but you can actually click your black uh, alligator clip to the, um, the other side of the ammeter. And I've got a red, alligator wire to this side of the battery pack. And so, if I connect, woo, you can't see that, so let me show you, please. If I connect the, um, I can see current flowing, see that? We can see current flowing, lovely, okay? Now, what's actually best, what's actually best if we put a switch in series? Okay, so I'm gonna put a switch in series and we're going to use a momentary push switch like that. Click, 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 click. 
and I think I'll just connect it down here. Now it doesn't really matter where you put it in the circuit, as long as it's put in, in series. And in series, a series circuit means that there's only one pathway for the electricity to flow. Okay, a series circuit, one pathway for the electricity to flow. Other circuits are like called parallel circuits and then there's more than one pathway. But for a series circuit, the electricity flows in the one circuit. And so now what I can do is I can connect the um, graphite rod and to see the conductivity, I press the switch and I can see a noticeable <laughs> effect on the ammeter. Okay, you can see a noticeable effect on the ammeter. So we need to draw this circuit and it's nice to have it set up so nicely. That makes it easy to draw. And so I generally like to start at the battery packs. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna go, um, that's one battery, two batteries. So I've got three volts. Here's my fourth one, four and a half. And here's my fourth battery. So I've got four times one and a half volts. So I've got six volts. That then comes to my ammeter. Now at ammeter, I draw with a circle and I put a big A. A for ammeter, like that. And then I can come to my alligator clips. Zoop. Alligator clip like this. I'll put my carbon rod in. I'll do my other alligator clip. Zoop, zoop. And then all my switch. Now, the switch looks like that. Okay, so that's an, what's called an open switch. Can you see the open switch there? If I press the button, then it closes. Okay, but at the moment it's open. So you can see that there's a gap. And so the electricity will not flow at the moment because I've got an open switch. Now, what we have to do is we have to set the alligator clips 10 centimeters apart. Okay, 10 centimeters apart. So let me get my next table ready. <laughs> Woo! My next table like that, which is wonderful. And I need to get a ruler. I need to get a ruler. And I need to set the alligator clips 10 centimeters apart. Now the the rod, oh dear, oh dear, Houston, we have a problem here. I think the rod is it's a, oh, mine's, mine's a tiny, tiny little bit short of 10 centimetres. So I have to put the alligator clips like right on the very, very edges. Okay, right on the very, very edges there, like that. It's a little bit of a problem, but that's okay. We can look at that a little bit later. Now, one more thing, one more thing to complicate things. Okay, to complicate things. We'll be able to see whether our current flows. Yes, we can. But I actually want to know what the voltage is across this. Okay, I need to know what the voltage is across this. And so I need to get out my voltmeter. Okay, so I need to get out my voltmeter. Now V, V for voltmeter. And this one gets, this one's a bit tricky. Most, most students get this wrong. Most students put this in series, the voltmeter in series and electricity doesn't flow and they say, oh, sure, it's broken, it doesn't work. Oh no, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. You see a voltmeter has got a very high resistance and it actually goes across, it actually goes across the circuit. It goes in parallel. So just to make it, I think, nice and easy, um, it's probably best if we just put it across the alligator clips. Okay, so I'm going to put it, across the alligator clip. So I'm gonna click one to the alligator clip there and this one to the alligator clip here. And what I'm actually expecting is pretty close to six volts. I'm actually expecting pretty close to six volts, but I'm actually getting five, okay? I'm getting, I'm getting a voltage of five volts. I wonder what you're getting. I wonder what you're getting. Okay, so I'm ready to do the experiment. I hopefully you are ready to do your experiment. Um, it's best if you use your values and I'll use my values, okay? So I'm just gonna use my values. So 10 centimeters 
and I click him on and it's not 0.5 amps okay 0 0.5 amps and the voltage is ooh, 5 volts okay 5 volts now to work out the resistance, we need a little bit of a formula. Okay, we need a little bit of a formula. And we're going to be looking at something called Ohm's Law later on, but we're going to have a little sneak preview now. But basically, Ohm's Law says this. It says that the voltage is equal to the current through the resistor, I for current, times the resistance. Therefore, if I rearrange this equation, I can get that the resistance is equal to the voltage divided by the current the voltage divided by the current so that's how we work out what the resistance is it's the voltage divided by the current so in the first case the voltage is 5 and the current is 0 0.5 and so that would make it a resistance of 10 ohms okay so a 10 centimeter length of um, carbon rod has got a resistance of 10 ohms. Look at that. Beautiful. Let's do 9 centimetres. No, let's do 8 centimetres. Okay, so here we go. I'll get my ruler out and clip him to 8 centimetres. Okay, what do you think will happen to the current? Oh, fell off. It's not very good. Let's put it on again. Oh, slide him back this way a little bit. Oh, scratchy, scratchy. A bit more. Oh, and eight centimeters exactly. And are we ready for it? Ready? Oh, 0 0.6, 0 0.6 amps. There's a higher current. The current has gone up 0 0.6 amps. I wonder what the voltage is. The voltage is pretty much the same, 5 volts. Okay, so I've got to do 5 divided by 0 0.6. Oh dear, I better get the calculator out. Hopefully it's not something really, really easy. That would be a disaster. <laughs> 5 divided by 0 0.6 equals 8.33 ohms. 8.33 ohms. Let's call it 8.3, okay. Oh! So, the shorter graphite rod has a smaller resistance. Hmm, okay. Let's try six centimeters. Okay, let's try six centimeters. So down we go, zip, zip, and Mr. Clicky, six centimeters. And press the button. Way! 0.7. 0.7 amps. The current has gone up. The current has gone up. The voltage is still 5 volts. Okay. And so we've got 5 divided by 0 0.7. 5 divided by 0 0.7 equals 7.1 ohms. 7.1 ohms. So... 7.1 ohms. Less resistance. Resistance is futile, they used to say in Star Trek. And now let's go to four. I wonder what will happen to the current, actually. I think I will know. I think the current will go up. Boom! Just don't hold it on for too long, all right? 0 0.9, 0 0.9 amps. 0 0.9 amps. And... Well, my voltage has gone down a bit, actually. I think it's giving the batteries a little bit of a workout. <laughs> so I'm going to go to um, 4. Point, what are we at? 4.4 volts, actually. 4.4 volts. That's because the reason the voltage has gone down is because those batteries are struggling to put out that much current. 4.4. Uh, divided by 0.9 equals 4.9 uh, 4.9 ohms 4.9 ohms which is whew, 
4.9 ohms. So we're really um, reducing the resistance there. And so now let's go to two centimeters, which the problem with that is it's almost a short circuit. Okay, a circuit that's got no resistance or very little resistance is what's known as a short circuit. That's not great for batteries, I can tell you. Anyway, here we go. Two centimeters and boom. 1.2 and 3.8. So 1.2, 1 1.2 and 3.8. So 1.2 amps and 3.8 volts. What will be the resistance? Let's find out. Um, 3.8 divided by 1.2 equals 3. 3 ohms. So the relationship's fairly clear. As you decrease the length, the resistance goes down. Or as you increase the length, the, the resistance go up. The longer the, resist, the longer the resistor, the greater the resistance. Which makes sense because... The electricity, the electricity has to like flow through the substance and it like bumps into the atoms causing agitations. And that bumping sort of like restricts the flow, hence the word resistance, restriction, restriction, resistance to the flow. Um, now I can see that with the numbers, but sometimes it's nice to see it on a graph. It's nice to see it on a graph. And so I'm going to show you how to do a line graph. I'm going to show you how to do a line graph. Now, if you're using a computer um, like Excel, actually, it's not a line graph. It's actually what's called an XY scattergram. But I'm not a computer, as you can tell. And so I'm going to do what we call the classic line graph. And so on your worksheet, you've got a, uh, a, graph, uh, like a graph like this. You can see the the lines, the horizontal lines and the vertical lines. And the question is, what do we put on the, the horizontal? Well, it's the thing that we chose to change. Okay, what did we change each time? Well, we changed the length. And so I write down the length and the length the units was in centimeters. So that is the, the label for what's called the X axis. So the X axis, X, X axis, the vertical one, is what we call the y-axis, okay, the y-axis. And if there was an axis coming, out, axis coming out like this, we'd call it the z-axis, but we're just doing x and y. Now, um, oh, forgot to put a title, okay? So let's put a title, and we'll call it resistance of graphite. Resistance of graphite. Always should put a title on your graphs. Uh, give, I mean, it's not the price of bananas, you know, in stormy weather. It's the resistance of graphite. So that's what your title should look something like that. Okay, now the length. Now, the length went from 10 down to 2, but we're going to go like the short value up to the long value. So I'm going to label that, that line 0. And then I'm going to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I've made it nice and easy, haven't I? I'm going to go up by uh, ones. So I'll go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Now, what's very important is that you might see that I've actually numbered. You don't have to number each line. You don't have to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But what's super, super critical, okay, super critical is that I've put the number directly under the lines, not like the spaces. I've actually numbered the lines. That's quite important. Okay, so number the lines. That's really, really important. And then the resistance is what we like calculated. And so I'm going to put resistance on the vertical or the y-axis, and that was in ohms. Now, the symbol for ohms is what's called an omega symbol. See that? Omega. Uh, that's a Greek symbol. And the resistance actually went uh, 10 down to 3. And so again, I'm going to go up by 1s because I'm pretty sure 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's very nice. Thank you for doing that. 1, 2, 3, 4. Notice that again, I'm numbering, I'm numbering the lines, not the spaces. Okay, so it's the, it's the lines 
It's the lines that are getting the numbers and not the spaces. And so for our length of 10 centimeters, it had a resistance of 10 ohms. So I go to 10 centimeters up to 10 ohms and I put a cross, okay? I put a nice cross there. See that nice cross there? Put a nice big cross. Then for eight centimeters, it was 8.3. Okay, so for eight centimeters, it was 8.3, which is about there. And for six centimeters, it was 7.1. Six centimeters, 7.1. Another cross, see, another nice cross. And what are we at? Four, it was 4.9. Four, 4.9. Four four, and two centimeters, it was Three. Now, if there was zero length, if there was zero length, it would have zero resistance. So some teachers might argue with me whether I should do this or not, but I think it's okay to put a cross on zero. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the line of best fit, which doesn't have to be a straight line. It can actually be a curve. Yes, a line can be a curve. I know that's confusing. But here we go, I'm going to try and show you in the one sweep, years of experience here. Um, you need to, you don't, it's not a dot to dot. It doesn't have to touch any of the points, okay? These points are just a guide. They're just approximations. So don't go like, like a, like a dot to dot, absolutely not. They're just going to guide the line. So for me, I can see it's gonna be a little bit of a curve. And so I'll go like so. A little bit of a sketch really, but not too sketchy. And it ends up looking like that, which clearly shows that as the length increases, the resistance increases. And it's almost linear. It's almost linear, but it sort of decreases with, um, with length there. That is that the, I guess the shorter the length, the, the steeper it is. Um, so in actual fact, this is what's called a non-ohmic conductor because an ohmic conductor actually has a perfectly straight or a directly proportional line. Uh, this has got a little bit of a curve. So it's actually what we call non-ohmic. And the reason is because it's not really a fair experiment because I'm changing the length, but I can also tell you that when it's quite short and there's a lot of current, it actually heats up. And heat also affects the um, resistance of a um, conductor. And so the problem is we're actually changing the cut and the length and that sort of affects the experiment a little bit. So what's the conclusion? Let's have a fairly basic conclusion, that's okay. I would basically say that as the length of a conductor increases, the resistance of the conductor increases. Um, and then I'd probably put, it appears to be non-ohmic. Now, if you want to test that out, test that theory out, you could actually repeat this experiment, but you do it under, under cold water. You'd actually do it in a glass. You'd get a glass of water and um, you would put it in the glass of water and that water would keep the um, carbon rod the same temperature all the time. And I bet, almost bet, that you'd um, end up with a straight line of a, well, a straight line relationship, a directly proportional relationship um, for that rod. So I hope you've learnt um, today, we've learnt about conductors and insulators. Conductors allow electricity to flow and are usually metals, but can be carbon rods or um, acids, bases, salts, uh, anything with charged particles. Insulators don't allow electricity to flow. Um, we did a, an experiment uh, where we put what we call the uh, independent variable, the variable that we changed on the horizontal or the x-axis, and the dependent, ver uh, the dependent variable which depends on the independent variable on the y-axis or the vertical axis. We did a title, we put our units, we put equal spaces for equal amounts. We plotted our points with crosses 
and we draw a line of best fit that doesn't have to touch any of the points but has to get as close as possible to as many as possible because that will help us see the trend. Okay, I look forward to seeing you next lesson. Bye for now. Welcome to lesson three of the Understanding Electricity course, batteries and switches. Now, the unit of energy is the joule, J-O-U-L-E, joule. Now, one joule is actually a very small amount of energy, I can tell you that. And an AA battery has about 10,000 joules of chemical potential energy. So an AA battery has about 10,000 joules, or you could say 10 kilojoules, because the prefix kilo means a thousand times. So 10 kilojoules or 10,000 joules of chemical potential energy. Now batteries come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Oh, this one's quite big, quite heavy. This is a D size battery, a D size battery. So you can write that down on the big battery on your sheet there. Uh, it's a D size battery. It's 1.5 volts. And we're going to explore what voltage is in one of the future lessons. Um, but it's really to do with what we call the electrical pressure. And so it's 1.5 volts, D size, and I can tell you it contains the same type of chemicals as the AA battery. The same type of chemicals, but a lot more of them. So this will actually have a lot more chemical potential energy, and so it can do a lot more electrical work. Uh, they used to be fairly common in these big things called ghetto blasters, which were like stereos that people used to carry around on their shoulders that used a lot of electricity. Sometimes you'd have up to like 12 of these in the one like ghetto blaster. Uh, quite expensive to run. The C size battery, okay, the C size battery is, mm, uh, I don't know, about half the volume of the D size battery approximately. And, you know, I don't know why it goes like D, C, A, A. Hmm, why wouldn't it go D, C, B, A? I'm sure there's a B size battery. I don't know, you can research that if you're, if you're interested. But the A, A battery, extraordinarily common, uh, 1.5 volts. And that 1.5 volts is actually determined by the type of chemical reactions that's going on in these batteries and the type of, chemi uh, type of chemicals involved. That's where the 1.5 volt comes from. Now, slightly smaller is the triple A battery. Triple A battery, relatively common these days. Um, you find them in like little um, uh, like portable speakers sometimes or maybe like little torches. But the triple A battery is a relatively common battery as well. Um, they all have the same chemical reactions uh, using the same chemistry. So they all have a voltage of one and a half volts. Um, but the one with the least amount of energy is obviously the AAA battery. And the one with the most amount of energy is the D size battery. Now that brings me to the nine volt battery. Oh, all of a sudden we've gone from like one and a half volts to nine volts. And what I can tell you is that the chemical reactions are actually very similar, right? Although this isn't a Duracell, I could have got a Duracell and I can actually guarantee that those chemical reactions are the same as the one and a half volt AA battery. But how do you make a one and a half volt, you know, chemical reaction into nine volts? Let me show you. If you open up this battery, which isn't a great idea because the chemicals are quite corrosive and caustic, um, and can damage the skin. But if you open it up, can you see how this battery is actually made up of different layers? They're like pancake together. See that? It's actually got six cells in series. Six cells in series. 
six one and a half volt cells in series. They're like stacked up like pancakes. Six times 1.5 is equal to nine volts. That's how, whoa, <laughs> oh, zingy zing. That's how you actually get the nine volts by stacking six one and a half volt batteries together. Now what that actually means is this actually doesn't have that much chemical potential energy. Each, you know, there's, it's probably still only got the same amount of chemical, well, less chemical potential energy than a C-sized battery. Just because it's higher voltage doesn't mean it's got more energy. It depends on how, how long it can actually put that current out. Um, similarly, now, this, this, this is a six volt lantern battery. Not very common anymore. Your parents might be familiar with it. It's the, the battery that used to power the dolphin torch. And almost every boat used to have a dolphin torch because if the torch fell in the water, the, the torch would float. Maybe you can go have a search of dolphin, uh, dolphin torches. There's a little picture of one right there. Now, it's six volts. Now, it's got the same um, chemicals as the 1.5 volt battery. So how do you get six volts? Any ideas? Well, let's have a look. They actually use four, four big cells in series to get your six volts. So one and a half plus one and a half plus one and a half plus one and a half, plus one and a half joined in series will give you your six volts. And these have got a lot of energy. Oh, well, they're quite heavy. They've got a lot of chemicals, a lot of chemical potential energy. So there we have it, the common uh, batteries that you might find around the house. So 10,000 joules, what does 10,000 joules um, sort of look like? Well, as I said, you can take an AA battery and you can draw an AA battery in that little box and say, hey, that's got 10,000 joules of chemical potential energy. Oh, the next one is 0.3 mil of petrol. Uh, if I get my little chemistry table here. Now, petrol is a very dangerous substance. Do not play with it at all, okay? Just fill up your car and that's it. Don't engage with petrol. You'll end up burnt. Now, I'm going to measure out 0.3 mil, okay? 0.3 mil. Now, that's not much, 0.3. In fact, I'm struggling to see the, the numbers on the side of the um, measuring cylinder here. Aha, uh -huh, I see it now. So 0.3 is literally only a couple of drops, okay? So in actual fact, can you see that swishing around there? Can you see that little bit of liquid swishing around there? That's got the same energy, chemical potential energy, as a one and a half volt battery. And so if I was to drop the petrol onto the um, heat proof mat there and light it, the chemical potential energy is being changed into heat energy and light energy. How much heat energy, how much light energy? Easy, 10,000 joules of heat energy and light energy. Um, because you can neither create energy or destroy energy, but you can change it from one form to another. And so we changed chemical potential energy into heat and light. So 0 0.3 mil. That's probably like, oh, I reckon about like six drops of petrol is the same amount of energy in a little AA battery. What's next? 0 0.6 um, of a Skittle. Now, admittedly, Skittles are one of my favorite lollies of all time. Um, they're actually made in New South Wales in a suburb called... Hornsby, and I actually spoke to one of the guys who works at the factory, and he said they are incredibly difficult to make. Skittles are incredibly difficult to make. The sugar processes in terms of heating and melting and cooling and um, allowing to get that uh, soft center and the hard crunchy shell, very challenging. Um, and I think a lot goes to waste, unfortunately. Now, 0.6 of a Skittle, that means I have to sadly bite off 0.4. Hmm, okay, so 0.6 of a Skittle there, 60% of a Skittle, has the same chemical potential energy as a battery. 
And we might see if we can convert that chemical potential energy into heat and light. What do you think? I'll light up the Bunsen burner. Oh no, I've got my tweezers. And I'm going to see if I can ignite ignite the oi yeah. I don't want to I don't want to drip no, I don't think this is going to work too well okay I know what I need to do I don't want to drip the the goopy stuff into my Bunsen burner because that will destroy it so let's try again let's try for scientific reasons only I have to remove 40% of the skittle I'm sure you understand Okay, let's try igniting it like this. Whoa, here we go. Oh. Sort of melting before, whoa. Sort of melting before it ignites, but I am very close to getting it to ignite and burn. Let's try again. Just turn the Bunsen burner down. Okay, I need to get another one. Thank you for your understanding. And let's try. Oh, stop dripping everywhere. I want it to burn. Oh, certainly a lot of smoke. Is it burning? Mm, not quite. But do you get the idea? Maybe I have to, like, cook it like this. Ugh, bubble, bubble. Ooh! I think I'm destroying my heat proof mat. Bit of a waff. Whoa! It, it stinks in this room now. Let's turn that Bunsen burner off. And put that there. So, a little bit difficult to show that that was changing into heat and light. Because I couldn't really ignite it because it was melting too quickly. So let's just put this away. Oh, like so. And what else do we have? Um, a car! A car travelling at 4.5 metres per second. Oh no, I didn't bring a little car with me. Let's pretend this is my car. <clears throat> brum, 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 brum. So just a, a standard car that's travelling along at 4.5 metres per second, which is not very fast. That's like, um, uh, eyes, four and a half. That's, um, that's a, a good jogging speed. So a car potting along at a good jogging speed has got 10,000 joules of energy. If it was an electric car, it would require one battery to get it going to a jogging speed. <laughs> so, yeah, if you're going to operate your um, Tesla off AA batteries, you would need an awful lot of them. I can tell you that now. Oh, but if you were to lift, and that's kinetic energy, of course, 4.5 metres per second of kinetic energy. Now, if you're going to lift the car one metre off the ground, then it would actually get four point. Uh, it will get ten thousand joules of gravitational potential energy. And how much work needs to be done? Well, it would need ten thousand joules of work, which would need ten thousand joules of chemical potential energy. So, if I was going to lift the car, um, how high? One meter off the ground. I'd have to eat zero point six of a skittle, so a little bit more than half a skittle, to have the chemical potential energy to lift the car up. That's if I was strong enough, which I'm not. Um, a one watt LED party light. So, I have got some LED party lights here. Let me show you this here. And I'm going to turn them on. I've got a little remote control zapper. And oi, look at that. Each one of those globes, okay, each one of those globes, um, well, is using a certain amount of power. It's using a certain amount of power. And so let me, well, try and turn them off and we'll talk about power very briefly because the unit of power is the what? What? Yes, what? Okay, W-A-T-T. -T. The unit of power is the what? And um, one watt is equal to one joule per second. So a device that is um, operating at one watt is using one joule of electricity every single second. So these lights here, okay, these lights here don't use a lot of energy, okay? They're LED party lights, and they will use one joule every second. 
So that means that means that a AA battery will actually run that light globe for 10,000 seconds because it's got 10,000 joules. That uses one joule per second, and so it will run it for 10,000 seconds. If I turn that off, hey, I sort of reappear. How good is that? And so you can draw, you can draw one of these like LED little party lights there. And, well, some of you have got down lights, which are, well, LED down lights. And this LED down light uses 10 joules per second. So its power rating is 10 watts. Okay, its power rating is 10 watts. Actually, rated wattage for this one is actually... 8 watts, 8 watts, close enough to 10 watts, don't, don't worry too much about that, okay? The human body, the human body actually uses chemical potential energy and changes it into like heat and electrical circuits, or well electricity as it's sending signals all over the place, um, kinetic energy going upstairs, um, gravitational potential, but a human body just like me sort of you know, sort of at rest, not doing too much activity, is using 100 watts, 100 joules per second, 100 joules per second, which actually means, which actually means an AA battery, an AA battery is only going to power me for about 100 seconds. And that's why we need to eat lots of food with lots of carbohydrate, which contain a lot of energy. So that's the human body. A microwave oven, okay, when you heat up your food, it uses a thousand joules per second, or a thousand watts, or you could call it a kilowatt. So, yeah, how long, how long would um, an AA battery last if it was powering a microwave oven? Well, if that's 10,000 joules, and it uses a thousand joules per second, the answer is 10 seconds. This battery would run your microwave for 10 seconds. Not very long. And a car driving up a hill, a car driving up a hill is uh, converting a lot of the chemical potential energy into gravitational potential energy at the rate of 10,000 watts or 10,000 joules per second or 10 kilojoules per second. And so it would require a AA battery every single second. Obviously, that depends how fast it's going up and the steepness, but this is just a bit of a, an average um, just to give us some ideas. And so there's plenty of space there to draw some nice little pictures of things like the human body, the microwave, a car going up the hill. So please draw those um, before you proceed with this video. That brings us to the second part of this lesson, switches. Okay, so I've got a torch here and it's off, but if I click the button, okay, if I click the button or the switch, then it goes on. Click it again, it goes off. Click it again, it goes on. It's a push button switch that stays on. So it's a switch. Now this light is similar, but it's got what's called a toggle switch. Okay, a toggle switch. And I can toggle it on and I can toggle it off. Now you're very familiar with toggle switches because you've got toggle switches all over your house, um, turning on power points, on lights, and off lights. So toggle switches. Switches are everywhere, and we're going to make a switch. We're going to make a switch. So in your set, you'll have a piece of wood there, a timber that's been laser cut with uh, the word switch on it and there'll be maybe two wires, hopefully. Now, if your set has been used up, the part's used up, and you don't have those wires or aluminium foil, well, aluminium foil's pretty easy to get, isn't it? You can just go to the kitchen cupboard. And I suspect that you could actually use, um, I suspect that you could actually use paper clips if, you're, if you don't have any wire in your set. So you could actually use paper clips. So to build the switch, what we need to do first is to get that bent wire, okay, get the bent wire, and we need to poke it through those two holes on the left, okay? Now, just be very careful that you don't poke the wire into your finger, 
because that will hurt. And depending on how much the laser cutter has gone through, and I'm looking at the other side of this one, and I don't think the laser cutter has actually gone through. So I've got a small problem, but just because I've got a problem doesn't mean I can't try and solve it. If you have issues, try and solve the issues. Think about what you can do. Well, I'm thinking oh, I've got a paper clip here, and I might bend that paper clip so I, I've got like a little sharp point there, right? And I'm going to like use it like a little bit of a drill, twisty. Whoa, see? I was able to poke through. See that? So let me do all four. Now, what could you use um, if you don't have a paper clip? Mm, don't use that mobile phone little thing that changes the SIM. Your parents might not appreciate that. Um, what about a little nail? Like a really skinny little nail? That would probably do the trick. But just be careful that when you poke it through, you don't like poke it through your hand because then you'll have another problem and that problem will be more painful. So I'm sort of twisting and rather than pushing too hard because then I'm not gonna like jab myself. So I've got the four holes now. And so now it should be a lot easier for me to poke the wire through. And here it comes. Yes, great. Poke one end through one side, the other end through the other side so that I've got a loop. See that, I've got a little bit of a loop now, which I can pull through. Now, before I pull it all the way down, I'm actually going to put the next wire in. So I get my next wire that I've bent over. So it's got a little bit of a loop at the top. And let's pop him in, push there, push there. And I'm gonna push, pull him all the way through. So he's actually now all the way through, so I've got a little bit of exposed metal there. See that? Then with my aluminium, now you can use aluminium foil from the kitchen, that's fine. I'm just gonna fold it again. Okay, I'm gonna sort of double up so that it's sort of got some rigidity to it. See, I don't want it too floppy. It needs to have some rigidity to it, and you do that by folding it up into like, this is probably about eight layers of aluminium foil. And I pop it through the, the loop that hasn't gone all the way down yet. And then I pull that down. So that hopefully should become my switch. But of course we need to test the switch, don't we? So we'll need some batteries in our battery pack. And a light globe would be great to test it. So let's connect our light globe and my other light globe, not my other light globe, a connector. <laughs> and I think the alligator clips again would be fantastic. So I'm going to do the black alligator clip coming off the light globe, black alligator clip coming off the light globe and connect it to one side of the switch. Okay, so I'm connecting it to one side of the switch like that and then I'm going to connect the other alligator clip to the other side of the batteries and I'm just going to do a quick test a quick you know fault finding test just to make sure that my circuit is great and just touch the alligator clips together see that it's good to sort of problem shoot as you go along that way you can work out where the problems are if something doesn't work now I connect to the other side of the switch and push down and look at that. I've made my own momentary switch. Isn't that awesome? How's yours looking? Is your switch like that too? It works better than I expected. Woohoo! Go tiny science lab. <laughs> so good, you can make your, ooh, look at that. That's a high frequency um, on and off. And this is a low frequency on and off. So what does an open switch look like? What does an open switch look like? Well, at the moment I've got an open switch. There is no electricity flowing. And so draw an open switch like that. That's how we draw an open switch. If I want to draw a closed switch, very simple. That bar 
moves down there like that to connect the terminals. So open switch, Whoop, there we go, open switch and close switch. You can see that I've actually done the circuit, I've put the um, open switch into a circuit for you already. You're welcome, you're welcome. Now, Morse code. There was, um, I believe in the 1800s, um, Samuel Morse uh, was, he was sailing, I think he was in England and maybe his wife and children went to America and, well he went to America and they stayed in England and he got a, a telegram and, or a letter, he got a letter saying that his wife and children had sadly passed away. And by the time he got back to England, they'd been buried for a long time. He missed him. So he thought there must be a quicker way to send messages. And so he came up with the Morse code. Now, if you're sinking in a ship, if you're sinking in a ship, you want to send an SOS. So we find S and we go dit, dit, dit. All right. So three quick ones. And O is da, da that and then s is dit 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 now the reason we use sos to send emergency messages is that s o and s is very easy to send very easy to remember so you need to remember that s three dits o three long ones and then another s three dits now what about if i send you a message okay I'm going to send you a message and see if you can um, decode the message. So I will, I will code my message. It will only be short. It's got one word. Uh, I will code it and then I will transmit it. You will see it, then you will decode it. Now, the best way to do it is actually to get ready just to write down the dit, dit, dits and the dat, dat, dats and then use the coding sheet after to decode it. Okay, so are we ready? I'm going to send the first letter. Da. Oh, I've already got it wrong. I've already got it wrong. I'm going to start again. Are we ready? The first letter. Dit. Da. 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 That was the first letter. Here comes the second letter. Dit. Da. Here comes the third letter. Da. Dit. Da. Dit. I'm going to send the fourth letter. Da, 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 and then the final letter is da, dit, dit, dit. All right, you might want to pause the video while you decode it. Okay, did you get it? My first name, Jacob. That's it, Jacob. <laughs> now, it would be really good if you could um, maybe send some messages to your brothers or sisters or to your mum or dad, have a bit of a practice at sending uh, the message. Oh, let's do one more, let's do one more. I'm gonna send one more word, okay, one more word. Are we ready? Okay, dit, dit, da, dit. Um, next letter, dit, dit, da. And then the final letter, da, dit. Okay, pause. And it is fun. Hey, I'm hoping that you find these electricity lessons not only uh, engaging and good learning experiences, but also a little bit of fun, a bit of fun as well. Now, do you know what? You can also send images via coded flashes of light. I know that sounds a little bit difficult to, you know, how is that possible? How can I send a picture using flashes of light? Well, we can do that by coding an image and then transmitting it and then decoding it. So we're gonna have a go at actually me sending you an image. In order to do this, we're going to need a grid and we're going to use a five by five grid. Okay, one, two, three, four, five um, rows and one, two, three, four, five columns. Now, let's say I want to send a, an image of a plus sign. Okay, so let's say I want to send an image of a plus sign. Here we go. So I'm going to draw this plus sign like this. And 
this is the, the image that I'm going to send. Um, what we'll do is I'm going to start with the first row and for every blank square, I'm going to go like dit, 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 dit. So I'm going to send the first row. Are we ready? Dit, 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 dit. So you'd put just dit, 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 little dots. Then I'm going to have a little bit of a break, like five seconds, and then start the second row. Dit, dit, right? So dit, dit, and then da, right? And then dit, dit. Third row, dit. You ready? Da, 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 dit. Fourth row, dit, dit, da, dit, dit. And then the fifth row, dit, 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 dit. There we go. And then you can like shade those um, full squares where there's a dat. And that's how we can send a plus sign. Amazing, isn't it? I'm going to send you another image. Are you ready? I'm not going to show you what it is. Okay, it's on my clipboard. I can see it. I'm going to code it and send it to you. Are you ready for the second one? Okay, for the first row. Da, dit, 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 da. Second row. Dit, da, dit, da, dit. Third row. Dit, dit. Oh, let's start the third row again because the light wasn't working. Dit, dit, da, dit, dit. Fourth row, dit, da, dit, da, dit. And then finally the fifth row, da, dit, 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 da. Okay, so time for you to quickly fill it out and see if you've come up with the image. Now, you can send Morse code via light. One of the problems is light travels in a straight line um, very, very fast, but the problem is that the earth is curved and so if you're standing further than, or if you're more than 40 kilometers away, because of the curvature of the Earth, you won't be able to actually see the light. Um, you can actually send it via radio signals, and they can sort of bounce off like clouds and that sort of thing, so you can send it further. But that is a limitation to sending these sort of messages. Did you get a multiplication sign? I hope so. If you have, if you have, then you've passed the lesson. If you haven't, go back and try and redo it and see if you can get it the second time around. So it's been great spending some time with you in this lesson three, batteries and switches and a bit of Morse code. And I look forward to seeing you in lesson four. Bye for now. Lesson four of the Understanding Electricity course, Loudspeakers and Sound. Now, do you know what this is? Hmm, do you know what it does? Well, it's a loudspeaker and it changes an electrical signal, electrical energy into sound. Now, I think this was pulled out of like some stereo set or something like that. This is a small little version of it. Basically the same thing. It's sort of got some magnetic stuff on the back. And it's got like a paper cone. And it's got some wires in there. Hmm. So where do we find loudspeakers around the home? Well, definitely find a loudspeaker in your mobile phone, in the earpiece section. It changes uh, the electrical signal into sound so that you can hear. You'll find, obviously, a loudspeaker in your earbuds or your headphones. Or you might even have like one of those JBL things. This is only a small little version. What are they called? Bluetooth speakers. And this is a little Bluetooth speaker. It's got a battery in here and it's got a loudspeaker up the top here. And you have to, or you can connect it via Bluetooth, or you can connect it via a jack. Uh, but it produces sound. In your lounge room, 
you might have some surround sound and so you might have a few of these loudspeakers around in different sizes now you can sort of well, I can sort of see it but you can sort of see a circle there that's because it's going to have a speaker that looks very similar to that in this box in your um, computer no actually this is from these are from TVs this is from these are two loudspeakers out of a flat screen TV and one on the left one on the right to make the stereo sound now they're not round they're rectangle or oval shape but again they've got that papery cardboard material and they've got some wires and I can tell you they will have some magnets in them as well or you might even have with your computer some extra large speakers and what you connect them to is you know one of there'll be a jack that will go into the computer probably not if you've got one of those Apple MacBooks because they don't have jacks anymore anyway but you also need to plug these into the power because it takes a little tiny signal through the ear jack and the power is used to amplify that signal and put it through the loudspeakers. Um, so you'll find speakers in radios, so computers, earbuds, headphones, um, did I say mobile phones? S loudspeakers are everywhere. I mean, if you didn't have a loudspeaker, then I'd sound like this. Well, I wouldn't sound like anything at all, would I? Because you wouldn't be able to hear me without the loudspeaker. And sound is made by a vibrating object. Now, if you really want to annoy someone, go get yourself a balloon, blow it up a little bit, and then squeeze the neck, and make terrible noises like that. Oh! Or even worse noises like that. <laughs> <laughs> so when I, when I made that funny, oh, I wonder where the the end of that is vibrating. You see, I meant to do that all the way along. That's a vibration. The the balloon's going backwards and forwards, and that vibration produces a sound. Now we can make a lot nicer sound than that using our tiny science lab electricity set we're going to play happy birthday so let's make the happy birthday circuit and to hear it you are going to need the loudspeaker so to hear it you're going to need the loudspeaker and if you look at on the back of it it's got a clear um, plastic backing and if you have a look that actually you can see you can see that it's actually got a loudspeaker in it, right? And, oh, I can actually feel like some magnetic attraction and I can feel some magnetic repulsion there as well. Push, push and pull, pull. Attraction and repulsion. And loudspeakers always have two wires that go into them. Okay, two wires. And there's one and there's the other. So it's got two connections. And this loudspeaker is no different it's got two connections as well. So you have to have electricity traveling through it for it to make sound. So that's why you need to have two connections to make a complete circuit. So to make a complete circuit, two connections. Now we're going to get a battery pack and I'll get a few of the pieces that you need, but we're going to set up that circuit right there now that red thing look that red thing is the loudspeaker and this is a photo of it from above so i'm pretty sure you should be able to work it out but we need a battery pack we need a fiver oh let me pop them here a battery pack a fiver we need this blue we need this blue it's it's called an integrated circuit music chip Okay, it's an integrated circuit music chip. And I wonder if I can open mine up. Don't you open yours because 
it might break and then that's not very good at all. If mine breaks, I, I've got plenty. So I would like to show you it. Okay. I wonder if, oh, there we go. I did open it up. And look at this. It's got some electronics in there. You can see some, it's got some electronics in there. That little black box there, that little black box that's got like legs, metal legs like a spider, is called the integrated circuit. And it's basically a computer chip. And it will contain the information to play happy birthday, but also it will uh, be able to make, uh, it's programmed, so it can make particular decisions when to do what, according to what switches are on and timing and that sort of thing. So that's what it looks like inside your Blue 21 IC chip, integrated circuit chip. And there we go, I can pop mine back together. Uh, we'll also need a 2R and a 3R and it looks like another 2R, two twos. And um, is that a one, two, three, four? Probably can do it with a four, I think. A four. And we need both switches as well. Both switches as well. So once we've got all those pieces, we can now set about building it. So let's see if we can build it. I'm going to put my power pack there. My sliding switch clicks onto there. I'll put my four up under the sliding switch, like this. I grab my loudspeaker. I don't think it matters which way it goes. Could be wrong though. I've been wrong before. And click him in. Uh-oh. I think I need another tour. I think I do. Click, click, click. And I'll put the, this switch in two switches. That's kind of strange, isn't it? And then another three -er. Yeah, and then certainly makes it easy. I need one more tour. Um, it certainly makes it easy when you've got the picture in front of you. I think it'd be a little, oh, I think it'd be a little bit complex doing it while you're seeing this video. But there we go. I think I've done it. How do I know? Let's try turning it on. Happy birthday to me. Hey! So that was nice. The loudspeaker played happy birthday. Did your loudspeaker play happy birthday? Now, remember I said that the integrated circuit chip makes particular decisions? Well, it's waiting for a new signal. So if I press this button, that will trip an internal switch and make it play again. Are you ready? Oh, but I've actually got to hold it down. Starts again at the beginning each time. Oh, you could really annoy someone with this, couldn't you? Oh, what could you do? Could you put in someone's shoe? <laughs> No, that wouldn't be a good idea. I think it would break. Um, have you got a little sister that you want to annoy? No, don't do that. Don't set out to annoy people. That's just not very nice at all. Now, do you want me to show you a little secret? Okay. Remember I said that um, loudspeakers have got a magnet in them and they've got some wires. Well, there's another device in here that has got a magnet in it and wires. Do you know what it is? It's a motor. A motor has got like wires and magnets and metal. And we might actually try clicking it into this circuit instead of the speaker. So can you replace your loudspeaker with your motor? I know, very strange thing to do, Jacob. But, you know, this is how we learn. This is how we understand electricity. So I've now put the motor where the loudspeaker should have gone. And I'll press my on button. Spins. Spins, but I'm going to put my ear to it. 
Happy birthday to you. <laughs> no, if you put your head to it, don't get your hair trapped in it because it will <laughs> rip out your hair and you'll scream. And that will be another high-pitched sound that will annoy any, everyone in the house. So not only does it spin, it also creates music as well. I bet you didn't know that you could use a loud, I bet you didn't know you could use a motor for a loudspeaker. Well, now you do. Okay, now you do. And with this wonderful set from Tiny Science Lab, you'll be able to create your own loudspeaker and I'm going to show you how to do it. Now, it is important that you leave this set up, okay? So we're going to make our own loudspeaker, and so we're going to put it in the same position where this original loudspeaker was, because it's easy to make a loudspeaker. The problem is testing with them and seeing whether they work, right? We can test this loudspeaker by putting it here and, ah, that loudspeaker works. Um, so what I'm going to do Okay, what I'm going to do, we're going to get out our two leads like this, our alligator clip leads, and we're going to put it in the same position that the, we're going to clip these into the same position where the loudspeaker was. Does that make sense? So we click that one there where one end of the loudspeaker was, and we click the other end here where the other end was, so that these two ends, if they are, uh, they are connected to the loudspeaker, they should play music. So I might even try that. So I've sort of got an extended version. See this? I've got an extended version. If I press the button, it should work. It does. La, 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 la. Hmm. I wonder whether I can taste happy birthday. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done this, but... Let's put the leads in my mouth and, oh, uh, oh. If you've got braces, oh, this would be amazing if this worked. Don't do it though. But I wonder if you click these to your braces and then put a magnet near your mouth, whether you'd be able to like hear the happy birthday through your bones, through your teeth. That would be very exciting. So, but don't do it. Well, maybe. Hmm. <laughs> Have you ever tasted happy birthday before? Imagine putting this inside a birthday cake and everybody just got leads and they had to put the leads in their mouth and they just had to taste the happy birthday music. I am a strange person, aren't I? All right, so we're going to make our own loudspeaker and you will need a little plastic thing like this. This is the how to make the homemade loudspeaker. Now, you know what? You could actually just use a plastic spoon, right? But this is more impressive than a plastic spoon, right? So you could actually wrap it around a plastic spoon and it will work, but we're going to use this thing. Now, don't exert too much force or you'll break it and you'll have to go and use a plastic spoon. Um, it's got a certain amount of strength, but not, not a huge amount of strength. It's just a little 3D printed plasticky thing. Um, obviously very valuable. What else do you need? Aha! Uh -huh. There's in the corner, there's a nice little coil of red wire. Now you'll notice that there's some, a coil of gold, well, copper colored wire and red colored wire. Now these are both copper but they're both enameled. That means that they've been painted with a plastic, all right? So that's that's coated with a, like a coppery coated plastic and this one's coated with a reddish plastic. And now what you need to do is sort of unwind it so that it's not a coil anymore. Now you will be able to reuse this, so don't throw it away, okay? Don't throw it away and to make a new coil, you can wrap it around like a texture or something like that to, to use again. This is reusable, okay? You can make the speaker, test the speaker, pull the speaker apart, put the parts back in the box and sell it again. It's a good idea, isn't it, hey? Yeah, it's called reusing. Now I'm trying not to twist my wire. Okay, don't just pull it tight, you know, because you'll have 
you'll put knots in it, but I've been able to do it without knots. See that? Well, I wonder how long it is. No, I don't. It's one metre long because I made these. So it should be one metre long. And if you want to straighten it out, you can just gently run your finger through it. Not so hard that it slices into your fingers, right? If you're a bit worried, get someone older to do it, uh, like so. And remember how I said that it's covered in plastic or an enamel? And so if I was to connect this alligator clip to it, nothing would happen because plastic is an insulator, right? Plastic's an insulator. It doesn't let electricity flow through it. So there's no point trying to clip onto it because it's got an insulator. We have to remove the insulator. And so if you go to the motor little kit, see where it says motor? Hopefully there'll be a piece of sandpaper. Okay, hopefully there's a piece of sandpaper under the motor set. Now, if there's not, you could, with your parents' permission, actually burn the plastic off with a match, right? Um, or you could go find some sandpaper from somewhere else. This sandpaper is not special. You could probably even rub it on some concrete or something like that. But I'm going to pull the wire through the sandpaper because I'm trying to remove the orange or the red plastic. All right, that's what I'm trying to do. So I'm trying, just, for, just from the last two centimeters or so, okay? Just from the last two centimeters or so. And if it breaks, you just start where the broken pit started, okay? But the wire, the copper wire is quite strong. There's some nice golden copper under there. Can you see that? Nice golden copper under the red. And what do you think you have to do next? Well, the other side, of course, because we need the electricity to flow in and out. Okay, so we need the electricity to flow through it. So both ends need to be sanded. You've got to remove that red plastic from both ends. Okay, like this. Very good. You just get sandpaper from the hardware, or from a painter, or just down in the workshop, in the garage, almost everybody or a neighbor. Everybody's got some sandpaper. Probably except for you. No, sandpaper's everywhere. I think that should do it. I think that should do it. I'll pop it back in. That way I won't lose it. And then. I have a maybe about 10 centimeters hanging out, okay, about 10 centimeters. And then about 10 centimeters from the end, I'm going to start, I'm going to start wrapping it around the leg of that little plastic speaker. So I'm just wrapping it around, coiling, coiling, coiling. As long as you do it in the one direction, it should be fine, okay? You can go up and down, up and down. It can go over itself. That's okay. But as long as you just keep doing it in the one direction, that's the most important thing, okay? That you, I'm, I'm doing mine clockwise, okay? I'm doing mine clockwise, which is the direction a clock goes, a clock goes. <laughs> and I'll keep doing it until the end, the other end is about 10 centimeters away as well. And it sort of, sort of, sort of sprung out a little bit there. Um, no, there we go. That's quite good. I don't, know if, don't. It's best if you don't tie knots and that sort of thing. So I've now got a coil and two ends like this. Now, believe it or not, this is your loudspeaker. Okay, this is your loudspeaker. And so I'm going to connect the loudspeaker, one end to the red and one end to the black. Now I'm actually folding my ends down a little bit to make it easier. I'm folding mine over to give a little bit more meat for the alligator clips to lock onto, all right? So that makes the wire, I could even do it. I could even fold it again if I really wanted to. No rules to stop me from doing that. But you definitely need it clipped in nice and firmly. Okay, so that's clipped in nicely and firmly. And now I can test it. Now I can test it. What do I need to do? Press the button.
funny enough, I was going to trick you and say, oh, it doesn't work. It doesn't make any sound at all. But the hilarious thing is actually making a little bit of sound. It's actually playing the music. First, my physics brain is going, it's, that's impossible. Why? Well, my physics brain says that's impossible because we need one more thing. I can explain it later why there's actually a little tiny bit of music. But to actually get some good music, do you remember? Remember what I was saying about the speakers? Remember what I was saying around the back? There's a magnet. And so you need to come pull out of your set the strong magnet. So I've got a nice strong magnet there. That's the one that's wrapped in the red and the black 3D print. That's a super magnet, okay? Keep that away from little children. Now, if I put the super magnet near the loudspeaker and press the button, the sound is a lot higher. Well, I should say the volume is much higher. It's quite audible. I'll prove it to you. Ready? See? It's a loudspeaker. And much louder when you put the magnet there. In fact, I might even have my button pressed down and I might even go closer and closer and sit. Oh, it attracted the alligator clip. I might even see what happens to the volume as I bring my loudspeaker in. Happy birthday to me. It's definitely the loudest uh, when it's closest. We've got some other magnets in here you can test. Okay, there's some other magnets that you can test it with. So the little um, ceramic magnets. These are not nearly as strong as the super magnet, but I'm sure they'll still work. Yep, they'll still work. And I've never tried this before. I might even try doing it near the motor. Let's see. Yes, because the motor is slightly magnetic. Now, how is it possible? How is it possible that it's making some noise when there's no magnet? Well, the actual funny thing is a coil of wire that has electricity flow flowing through it actually becomes magnetic. So it's actually creating its own little magnet here. And then the magnetic force from the signal is sort of like interacting with itself, which is producing the music. So... Fantastic. Now, you could even, this is a little, we've got to be careful with this, but I get it, I've done this before where I get a little kebab stick, or a chopstick is probably even better, and I attach a little iron nail with sticky tape to the end of the chopstick, and then I wrap that around the nail, so that it's coiled around the nail. Put the chopstick in my between my teeth, <laughs> like this, and then I put the nail in the coil near a magnet and I can actually hear the music through my bones, through the teeth. I'm not kidding you. It's true. It's true. How does, how does a loudspeaker work? Well, it's called the motor effect. Even though a loudspeaker is not spinning, a loudspeaker depends on a motor effect. A loudspeaker goes in and out, right? So a loudspeaker goes in and out. I don't know if you've ever seen a loudspeaker vibrating before, but look it up on YouTube, vibrating loudspeaker. You'll see um, loudspeakers going up and down. So there has to be some force to push them up and some force to pull them down. Push, pull, push, pull, push, pull. Um, push, attraction, push, attraction. Okay, Repel, attract, repel, attract. That's what's happening in a loudspeaker. And so I've got a little bit of a demonstration for you. And let me show you this demonstration. I'll just move this equipment over here. And I've got this little piece of equipment. It's like a little swing set for Lego men. It's a little swing set for Lego men. It's got a copper pipe. It's got a copper pipe here. And the copper pipe is attached to two wires and the wire, one wire goes up and it's electrically connected the wire 
I've, I've pulled the insulation off and I've wrapped it around this bolt. So it's electric connected to this arm. And then this side is electrically connected to that side. And I need to run some electricity through it. Now, I don't know whether the six volts will do it, but uh, my company has, Tiny Science Lab, has actually developed for the classroom a special skin to suit Ryobi's. So this is actually our product, Tiny Science Lab product. Looks, I don't know, what does it look like? Looks like some type of alien. Uh, but what you do is you go down to the garage or Bunnings, whatever, and you get a, a battery, 18 volt Ryobi 1 battery. And look at this, you, um, this is so cool. You click it onto the battery, and now instead of 18 volts, you actually can get 12 volts coming out of these two things, and so it can be used for schools. And there's even a, like a little USB charger that is phenomenal. Now I'm going to connect it so that electricity flows through the um, swing. So I'll have to pop this like this, move some things out of the way and I need one extra alligator clip so that one gets connected to the battery. I'm going to bring it to the switch, to the switch. From the switch from the switch, I'm going to connect to one side of the copper rod by connecting up here. So you can see that the electricity is going to flow down through this wire, down this switch, uh, down this wire across this rod up here. And I need it to come back. I need it to come back to the uh, power pack. And so I'll connect him there and I'll bring him back to the power pack like that. So now we've got a complete circuit ready to go with the switch. Now notice there's no movement whatsoever. Okay, there's no, well there's a tiny bit of movement. Maybe my breath is causing it to move. But I'm going to press this button. Let's have a look. Oh, did you see that? I'm going to do it again. Click, click, click. Click, click, yay! I'm making this swing go backwards and forwards. Look at that, woohoo! Making the switch go backwards and forwards. Not the switch, I'm making the swing go backwards and forwards. Now there's one more thing that you can't see. Does anybody know what that thing is that you can't see? Are you ready? I'm going to show you the bottom of this. What do you think is under there? Apart from some terrible carpentry work. <laughs> There's a magnet. There's a magnet down there. And the magnet, it's got a south magnetic pole pointing upwards. And so the magnetic field goes down from north to south. Okay, so my fingers are representing the magnetic field. Like this, the mag my fingers represent the magnetic field. And I'm using my right hand because this will actually help us understand the motor effect. The fingers show the direction of a magnetic field. And the fingers, okay, um, need to be pointed in the direction of the magnetic field. So I'm going to make sure I point these fingers down because the magnetic field goes from north to south. And the top of the magnet in this wood is south, so it's going from north to south. Then, the, oh, this is going to get a little bit awkward. Then, this is quite tricky actually, um, the current goes in the direction of your thumb. Okay, and maybe if I rotate this around a little bit, oh, that's a bit easier. Okay, the current goes in the direction of your thumb. So, the current is actually heading guess towards you and then the palm shows the direction that the force acts the palm shows the direction as the, that the force acts and so if I press this button it should swing that way it should swing that way please well it will swing that way and then gravity will pull it back but it first should swing that way are we ready hopefully physics doesn't fail me 
Yay! It did, it went that way. I promise, I promise. I'll do it again, ready? Woo! See that? It swung that way and then gravity pulled it this way. What about, what about if I reverse the current? Okay, so I'm going to change the polarity this time. This time the magnetic field's still the same from north to south, but now the current is towards me. And so the magnetic field is forcing the rod that way. Will it start swinging that way this time? Are you ready? Let's see. Ready, set, yay! Very small amount. You're like, hey, that hardly moved at all. Well, look carefully. Ready? Woo! Did you see that? Swung a little bit. Now, if the current was bigger or the magnetic field was bigger or the rod was longer, then it would, um, you definitely see it move um, a lot better. So that is the force on a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field. And we understand that force using the right hand rule. And so in a magnet, if you pull it apart, you'll see a magnetic field. You'll see wires, which are carrying the electricity, and you'll see the force being pushed. And if you reverse the electricity, it will pull it. So the electricity changes directions. And so you get a push, a pull, a push, a pull, a push, a pull, a push, a pull. If you do it very quickly, you get a high frequency sound. If you do it very slowly, then you get a low frequency sound. If you use a big current, you get a big force, and so you get a loud volume. If you use a small current, you'll get a, lot, a small force, and so you'll get a small volume. So, I hope that this lesson has helped you understand electricity a little bit better, particularly loudspeakers and sound. I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson. Bye for now. Understanding Electricity, Lesson 5, Series Circuits. And we're going to be looking at current, voltage, resistance, and Ohm's Law. So let's set up some series circuits. We need our battery pack. And let's get a light globe. And look, basically a series circuit is one where there's only one pathway for the electricity to flow. The electricity doesn't have any choice. Not that it's got a brain and can think, but it will go just simply in a circuit um, and it doesn't like veer off and break up into two parts or anything like that or three parts. There's just one pathway for it. So it's good to put a switch in sometimes and I'll put in a switch in like now. I'm going to use number 14, the momentary push button switch. And let's get a nice long connector, fiver and bring it back to, oh, how about I do, do like a nice little square circuit. We do a bit of a square circuit this time. So it looks sort of, um, hmm, sort of neat. Oh, that's nice. That's a nice, neat one, isn't it? There we go, beautiful rectangular circuit, hey? Eh? Like that, love it. And if I press the button, um, the switch, close the circuit, the electricity goes in the one path. Very simple to draw. So let's just draw it. Uh, here I've got my um, voltage source, my source of electromotive force. And notice I introduce new terms and I don't necessarily explain them each time, but it will help us build up an understanding of electricity and later on I'll spend more time explaining some of those terms. Come to our light globe, which is a circle just with a cross in it. Come to our switch and bring it back to the battery. So that's the, the first circuit. One pathway. For the electricity to take. Then what about if we add a second light globe? So I'll add a second light globe, put a screw in here, 
And instead of number four, I'm going to put the light globe where that was. Aha! So now I've got two light globes in series. Two light globes in series. And oh, when I turn it on, they're a lot dimmer. Okay, so this is the circuit this time. And when I turn it on, it's a lot dimmer. Hmm. That's because the electricity has to run through these really thin wires in the light globes, which sort of resist the flow of electricity. Uh, and now that I've got two resistors or two light globes, that causes the current to decrease. And so the brightness goes down. Now, in actual fact, many teachers and textbooks actually um, give a little bit of incorrect information here. They say that, well, if you um, put a second light globe in series, the current goes down by two, which is true, and they say that the brightness goes down by two. They say that the brightness is half. That's actually incorrect. Did you know that the brightness actually goes down by a factor of four? Like it's a quarter, quarter as bright as if you had one in there. Let's see if you can just see that. Let's just see. I'll just have one light globe. Let's have a look at how bright it is. It's quite, that's quite bright. That's quite bright. Put a second light globe in. Put a second light globe in. It's, it's a lot dimmer. And I can actually measure that and tell you that each globe is actually four times dimmer than the original. So let's draw this one. Now I'm going to cheat just a little bit because I'm going to use the same circuit. I'm going to use the same circuit. I'm just going to rub out that little bit with my finger and put in the second light globe like that. I know, I know it's cheating. Okay, you probably have to draw a brand new circuit with two light globes. Tough luck. Okay, there we go. Now, we could add a third light globe in series if we want. We could, but... I'm actually going to replace one of those um, globes with the motor because that too, this too, is a series circuit. One light globe and one motor, there's only one pathway for the electricity to take. And, oh, the motor goes on. Someone might say that the circuit's not working because the light globe's not going on. Let's try putting the fan on the motor and just see what happens. What? With no fan, the motor spins, but the light doesn't come on. Put the fan on, and now the mo and now the, the, the fan turns and the light comes on. But more importantly, watch what happens to the brightness of the globe. Can you see that? Look at that brightness of the globe. You ready when I start it up? Starts off bright and then goes quite dim. Shall we watch that? Oh, there's a lot of physics there to understand that, I can tell you. But basically what is happening is, when the motor starts spinning, it actually starts generating electricity in the other direction. And that actually like pushes uh, the voltage pushes against the forward voltage and the current goes down. Without the fan on, it actually reaches top speed very, very quickly and so generates an electric current to push, well, a voltage that pushes back almost immediately and virtually no current flows. If you want to get current to flow, you've got to grab. <laughs> you've got to grab the motor and stop it from generating electricity. So look at that. When I grab it, it stops generating electricity and the electricity flows through it. But if I don't grab it, it actually generates a voltage and pushes back against the batteries. That's, a, that's due to conservation of energy, um, but that's actually like a year 11, 12, actually year 12 physics topic. So it's quite complex. Very good though, though but that's our third um, series circuit. And I'm going to cheat again because I'm going to rub out one of the light switches, not light switches, I'm going to rub, rub out one of the lights, and I'm going to put in a circle with a big M. 
because that's the motor in series. And we would say that the electricity flows, this is the positive, the long arm, the long arm is the positive, the short arm is the negative, and the electricity flows from the positive to the negative. And so we can put a little arrow like this to show the flow of electricity. And the amount of electricity that is flowing is called the current. And we represent the current, believe it or not, with the letter I. Strange, I know, I know. Sometimes science is strange. But we represent the current direction of current flow with an arrow. And the size of the current is called I. Hmm. Very, very strange. Now, what is the relationship between changing, changing the voltage and the current that flows through the circuit? That's our experiment now. We're going to do something called Ohm's Law. And so we will pop away the motor. We don't need the motor. Uh, we, we will need a light globe and the battery and a switch. We're also going to need your ammeter which measures electrical current, I, and your voltmeter, which measures electrical pressure, the push. So ammeter measures current, which is the flow, how much electricity flows, like a little bit like water through a pipe. You can measure, you know, how many liters per second. Well, this measures um, how many, um, what is it, coulombs per second, um, which is the amount of current, and voltmeters measure electrical pressure. So a little bit like if you have a, a water pipe and you turn it on a bit and the water squirts out at a high pressure, well, that's water pressure, well, this measures electrical pressure. Now, with this circuit, to measure the current, we actually have to have electricity flowing through the ammeter. Okay, we have to have the electricity flowing through the ammeter. And so very, very simply, we will connect the ammeter from one end of the um, uh, click, uh, the, the conductor, the number five for me, and I'm going to bring it back to the battery. And so I've got a complete circuit, okay, a complete circuit like so. And if I press the button, the light comes on and current flows. So light comes on and current flows. You can see that there's some current flowing <coughs> because the needle is moving, excuse me. Now the voltage is a little bit trickier. The voltage is a little bit trickier. We actually have to put the, the voltmeter across, across the light globe. Okay, so we actually put the voltmeter across the light globe like this. I'm clicking it on. I'm clicking it on to either side of the light globe. It's actually in parallel. It's not in series. It's in parallel. Um, only a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of electricity goes through the voltmeter because the voltmeter actually has a very high resistance and so resist the flow of electricity through it. Now if I press it, you can actually, you can see a reading on the voltmeter. That way you know you've got it set up right. Yours might maybe need to be turned around or something like that. But it goes across the light globe and the ammeter goes in the circuit so that the electricity flows through it. So quite straightforward to draw, really. Um, well, actually, it's not. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. It's not straightforward to draw, but we can do it together. I'm going to start with the um, battery. It's always a good thing to start with. And that actually goes to the light globe, like this, with my little cross. This comes to my switch, like this. And then this comes to my ammeter. And that comes back to my battery. Now I've left one thing out, and that's the voltmeter. And the voltmeter we draw in last, and it goes across the light globe, like this, and it's called a V. So that's the circuit. The ammeter will measure the current, and the voltmeter will measure the voltage.
Well, we've got a first reading already, believe it or not. The first reading already <laughs> is when there is no voltage, so the switch is off, okay, the voltmeter reads zero, the ammeter reads zero, and so our first reading for the voltage is, our first reading for the voltage is zero, and our current is zero. So that's a very straightforward one. Now, it's a little bit tricky, okay, a little bit tricky to do this, but we actually want to try and do a single battery. So we're going to try and do 1.5 volts, okay, 1.5 volts like that. It's going to be a little bit tricky to do, but we can do it. We actually have to pull the battery apart to get one battery, um, one battery out. And you know what? I've just thought of an easier way to do it. What we can actually do is get one of our leads, one of our leads, this is it. And I'm going to connect one lead to the spring and then I'm going to hold the other end to where the, the battery goes. I'll just check. Yes, it does work. See, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm sort of like replacing this battery with a wire so that I'm only being, we're only powering with the one battery there, but I have to sort of push the end where the end of the battery goes. So we're placing the battery with the wire and it works. Yes, it does work. So I'm gonna read my, my uh, let's have a look, the voltage. <clears throat> Let me double check. Is, um, oh, it's a, mine is actually a little bit more than 1.5. It's actually um, 1 point, hmm, 1.6. It's 1.6 volts. <clears throat> oh, a little bit less. 1.6. Oh, no, I'll go 1.6. Strange to get 1.6 from a 1.5 volt battery, but I'll record that. So I'm actually going to put a 1.6 there. You record what your voltmeter says, okay? You, re you record your own voltmeter. And then the ammeter, oh, I've got to hold the, hold the, um, okay, well, let's have a look. What does my voltmeter say? It doesn't say anything, but it does read something. It reads 0.2 amps, 0.2 amps. So 0.2 amps. The next one is we're going to put both batteries in. I've never actually done it like that before. I think that was a good solution. And now I will, oh, the voltage has gone up, that's for sure. It's now 2.8, 2.8, 2.8 across the light globe. And the current, is 0.3 amps, 0.3 amps. Oh, well, there we go. The voltage has gone up, the voltage has gone up, and the current has gone up. Hmm. The voltage has gone up, the current has gone up. Now let's do three batteries, three batteries. This is going to definitely get a bit trickier. So, three batteries, well that's four. I'm going to, it's a, we've got to do this in series again, of course, so that the electricity has to travel in a circle. And let's pull out one of the batteries and use my little trick where we replace the battery with a lead. So I click the lead on the spring, press the other bit the other end of the alligator clip to the where the battery terminal is and okay whoa that's a lot brighter and the voltage is whoa i'm going to call it 3.9 volts i'm going to call it 3.9 volts so 3.9 volts you record whatever yours is reading and the ammeter the current oh don't forget, you've got to push it on. Bring it a bit closer so I can see it better. 
0.4. Yeah, 0.4 amps. I've got 0.4 amps. And our final one is let's put the other battery in like that. Put the little lid on. So now I've got the four batteries in series. The voltage is four point for me. Um, no, it's not. It's five point two. For me, it's five point two. Five point two, and the current is point four two, not point four two. 0.42 so that's my final readings there so hopefully you've got your own readings they should be fairly similar to this they should be fairly similar to this but it's important that you're doing these experiments yourself that's how you learn that's how you learn now it's very important to graph results so that we can see like the relationships, we can get a better picture. It's hard to look at a bunch of numbers and see sort of what's going on. But if we do a graph, then we get a much better picture. And we're going to do what's called a line graph. Now, if you're doing this on the computer in Excel, it's actually called an XY scattergram. It's actually not a line graph. But if we're drawing it like this, then we're going to do a line graph. So I've got my grid here, which is a, it's 10 lines by 10 lines. I'm gonna do a title and we'll go a series circuit. And it's to do with voltage and current. So a title should be short and snappy and just give a little bit of a picture. I mean, it's not like how high will a ball bounce when dropped from certain heights. You know, they might get a graph fairly similar. No, this is about our um, experiment that we just did. Now, the thing that we change goes along the bottom. That's called the independent variable. Now, we changed the voltage each time by putting in different numbers of batteries. So I'm going to write uh, well under here, voltage and V voltage and V because I want to have the name and the units under the first line I'm going to put zero I love trying to start as many graphs as possible at zero I really do I think it's very very important and the voltage goes up to 5.2 voltage goes to 5.2 so if I count my lines 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 oh I'll go up. I'm going to go up by ones. Now, notice under the line, I put the number. Under the line, I'm actually numbering the lines. Three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, oh, you can go up to ten. Eight, nine, ten. That's nice. And now the dependent variable which depended on the independent variable. So the current depended on the voltage goes on the vertical. So I'm gonna go current, and I'm gonna write it vertical. And that's in amps, so capital A. And it went from zero to 0.42. So I might actually, I'm gonna go up by halves. So I'm gonna go half, one, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, four and a half, five. Because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use up as much of the graph paper as possible. I'm trying to get the biggest graph I possibly can. So it's okay to go up by um, different, like a slightly different scale, as long as you're consistent on the one scale. So this time every two lines is equal to one on the vertical. That's fine to do that. Now, first point is zero, zero. Zero volts, zero current, and so I'm gonna put a cross there. My second point is 1.6 volts, 1.6 volts, which is about here, and 0.2 amps, which is, um, oh, hang on. I'm gonna go, 
I've gone up one, two, three, four, five, but I actually meant to go up by like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Not one, two, three, four, five. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 for the current. Very small current. Um, and so 1.6 volts and 0 0.2. There's my 0 0.2, there's my one point. I'll put a cross like that. 2.8 volts goes to 0 0.3. 2.8 volts goes to 0.3. So 2.8 volts goes to 0.3. There. And 3.9 volts goes to 0 0.4. There. And 5.2 volts goes to 0.42. So 5.2 goes to 0.42. Interesting. 0.42, which is about there. Very, very interesting. I'm going to sketch this graph in. Sketch the line of best fit. And it's actually a curve. Okay, it's actually a curve. And it looks like that. It looks like that. What this shows me is that as I increase the voltage, the current goes up. But at these sort of higher voltages, the current doesn't go up nearly as much. It's sort of like, almost like reaches a maximum. So it's not what we call a directly proportional relationship. If it was a directly proportional relationship, it would be going up like just in a straight line. That it, you know, if you double the voltage, you double the current, triple the voltage, you triple the current. But this is quite interesting here. The fact that it's sort of like um, that the amount that the current goes up actually sort of decreases each time. And there's a very good reason for that. And that's because something else apart from the voltage and the current changes in this circuit. What else changes? I'm pretty sure I've mentioned it before. Whoa! See how bright that light is? That light's super bright. What about if I take one of the battery packs out? Whoa! Not nearly as bright. So in actual fact, there's something about the light that is affecting things. And that is the temperature of the little tiny wire in the light globe. It's changing. And as the temperature gets higher each time, that actually increases the resistance each time. So the light becomes more resistant. And so in the next little experiment, we're going to repeat this experiment, but we're gonna be a bit smarter. We're going to use a resistor that doesn't change temperature. So we're going to be a bit smarter this time. And, excuse me. <coughs> I'm going to get a bowl with some water in it. Now you're right, water and electricity don't mix that well. And I'm going to get my um, graphite rod out, like this. Now, with my graphite rod, I will need my two electrical leads. And one lead goes on one side, and the other lead goes on the other side. And that is going to go in the water. Now, I'm not trying to electrify the water or anything here. All I'm trying to do is keep this cool. Okay, that's all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to keep this cool. Now, I also suspect that I probably only want to go to the halfway mark. Okay, that's what I also suspect. So I'm actually going to just do the halfway mark and I'll put that under water. Now let's set up the circuit. Very similar, we need the battery, we need a switch so that we can turn it on and off. We can put an ammeter in. Now the interesting thing is it doesn't matter which position any of these sort of go in, as long as it's like one complete um, circle. 
and no light globe this time and so now I'm just going to connect that like so and I'll just check to see that I get a current flowing yes I do half an amp which is fantastic um, which probably actually means I can actually probably go that full length let me just have a little look yeah, I am. I'm actually going to keep this the full length. I still get a reasonable current flowing, so I am going to keep this the full length. Okay, so make sure this is the full length. Kept nice and cold. We're missing one important thing, and that is the that is the voltmeter, which has to go across has to go across the uh, the resistor. So I'm going to go across from one end of the alligator clip to this end of the alligator clip. And I should get around three volts and I do. So that's perfect. So do we have to draw this circuit? No, because it's so similar to the other one. It's so, so similar to the other one. But let's get ready to record some data. Okay, some raw data. So I've got my clipboard and my table. I've got my results table here to record my raw data in and zero volts again zero volts zero current so voltage is v current is amps zero voltage zero current now oh no i've got a problem the problem is i've used up my two alligator clips so i can't do the trick i was going to do before so what the trick I'm going to do, I want to just use one battery. So I'm going to pull that out and put the battery, stand the battery on the terminal of the, of the switch. <laughs> it's a little bit tricky, tricky, tricky. And stand it like that. Now I've just got one. Oh, it's going the wrong way. So I turn it over and do it like that okay now i've got some i've got some readings now so the voltmeter reading the voltmeter reading is 1.6 so the voltage is 1.6 and the current is hmm, let me get this right oh it's about 0.15 0.15 amps 0.15 amps so that's our first reading 1.6 volts and 0.15 amps next part is easy because you can just put your batteries back in because now we're just going to do it with two batteries so that's straightforward we don't have to perform any miracles using tilted batteries and all the rest of it the voltage is um, two point ooh, two point eight, two point eight volts, two point eight volts, and the current is point three, not point three, not point three amps. Oh no! Now I've got to do three batteries. Oh, tricky, tricky, tricky. How are we going to do this? All right. Let's connect the batteries in series using a tool like that. Now, that's four, but I only want three, so I have to... Oh, no, this ain't... This is not going to work. It's not going to work because I don't have a wire to do this. Okay, so pull that back out. Oh, wow. Okay, we can make this happen. We can make this happen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stand the battery upside down on that terminal. Okay, I'm going to stand the battery upside down on that terminal there, right? And then put the lead on top of that. That will give me three batteries in series. Yes, it has. I know this is tricky, but you can do it. I need three batteries in series and you can see that you're getting the right expectation. So I've got four volts. Four volts. Yes, I am. Four volts. 
and what's the current? Standing it upside down, put that on the end. This is not easy. Uh, 0.4 amps. 0.4 amps. 0.4 amps. So I've got four volts, 0.4 amps. Oh, and then the final one is a lot easier. The final one is a lot easier because we can go and use our batteries again like that. Whew. Tricky, tricky, tricky. And complete circuit, piece of cake. Press the button. I've got 4.4, 4. 4. 4.8, 4.8 volts, 4.8 volts, and a current of 0 0.5, 0 0.5. I'm very excited to graph this. Like, I really actually do love doing graphs because it tells us so much. So there's the results if you're not doing your own. And I'm super excited to do this. This time we've got a cooled, cooled resistor. Okay, so a cooled, cooled resistor. And I'm going to call it Ohm's Law. Ohm's Law. Again, we'll do the voltage on the uh, X axis, because the voltage is what we changed. It's the dependent variable. <laughs> it's the independent variable. We'll start at zero, and we're going up to 4.8, so I'll go one. Oh, only going up to 4.8 this time, not 5.2. Oh, so this time I'm actually going to go up by halves. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five. Okay, a little bit different this time. I can change it for me this time because I'm only going up to five volts. And the current goes up to 0 0.5, so I'm going to go 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. I really am using up the entire graph paper. I'm very happy. Zero, zero is my first reading. Okay, 1.6, 1.6 volts and 0 0.15. 1.6 and 0 0.15. Uh, goes a nice cross there and 2.8 and 0.3 2.8 and 0.3 that's about there and 4 and 0.4 getting a very different graph this time and 4.8 and 5 okay 4.8 and 0.5 Look, look at that, that, almost need a ruler for this one, almost need a ruler, we, this is, this is, this is fantastic, look at that graph, remember the previous one, sort of like tapered off, this one, look, that's a directly proportional relationship. That's what Ohm's law is. Ohm's law tells us that if we double the voltage, we double the current. Triple the voltage, triple the current. Quadruple the voltage, quadruple the current. It's a directly proportional um, uh, relationship. Basically, this tells us that um, V is equal to IR because uh, what should we call? I better put current here. Current. Current. What does this actually tell us? It tells us that. I'll tell you. I'll show you what it tells us because this is very exciting. <laughs> Let me. Oh, I'll, I'll use the whiteboard. Okay, I'll use the little whiteboard. Just rub out. Urgh! Rub that out. Rub that out. Oh, this is. I get excited about small things, don't I? Um, but this is a big thing with electricity. If that's the, the voltage and that's the current, and if we have a relationship like that, that is saying that I divided by V is equal to a constant, okay? 
And that constant has to do with resistance. That constant has to do with resistance. And that is that if you double the voltage, you double the current. Now, that's very, very close to Ohm's law. And Ohm's law is this. V is equal to IR. V equals IR. Because if you go V over I, you get the resistance. Okay? Now, in this case, the resistance stayed the same because we kept it cool the whole time. And so the resistance did not change. So what is our conclusion or our discussion? Our discussion is that using a cooled resistor, the relationship uh, between current and uh, voltage was directly proportional. That is that when you doubled the voltage, you doubled the current. Tripled the voltage, you triple the current. Fantastic. Um, I'm excited because I didn't actually expect those results to be that good, to be perfectly blunt. So, what a beautiful graph. What a graph. Look at that. I love it. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you next lesson. Bye for now. Hello, understanding electricity, lesson six, water, electricity, analogy. Now, funny enough, this lesson, we're not touching anything to do with like electricity, but you'll probably learn more about electricity using water and pipes than you'll learn about electricity doing electricity. So, first, you might have a syringe and I'm going to draw a bit of water up into this syringe and I'm going to give it a little push hmm. and we get a small flow rate. Do that again. Fill up the syringe, a low force push and we get a small amount flowing out. Well, the flow rate is low. What about if I draw more up, but this time push hard. Whoa. The pressure was high and the flow rate was high. Let's do that again. Exert a large force. Large force, large flow rate. Hmm, high pressure, high flow. We're going to do an experiment where we're going to use this tube, which this tube here, uh, it's one meter long. It's um, just five millimeter air hose uh, from a, you know, from a fish tank, blows air into a fish tank. See that? Um, looking at that, it's not quite full, so I've got a bit of water here just to top it up. There we go. That's at 100% now. There's a dark mark there that you probably can't see, but I can see it. And I'm going to use this as a siphon. Now, what a siphon does is well, it allows water to flow through it. But I want it to like sit in there without coming out. So I could maybe like some use some sticky tape or something like that. I'm gonna use a little heavy weight. Now, you don't need a fish tank to do this. Okay, you don't need a fish tank to do this. Um, I think I've just squeezed that a bit hard, actually. I have too. Oh, I've squeezed it too hard. I'm sort of restricting the flow. That's not what I wanted to do at all. So what am I gonna do now? Now I have to try and push this out a bit. Hmm, tricky, tricky. I wonder if I can just like tie a knot with this plastic zip tie. I just want it to hold it in place. I think that might do it. Tie a knot, yeah, that's better. And bring it down. Perfect. Now, if I... <coughs> All right, I didn't quite go according to plan. Um, but now that this hose is full of water, look, I can see that see that flow? Okay, the, the water is siphoning out. Now, what people are sometimes quite surprised to see is that the water can go up and then come down. So look at this, the water comes up then comes down. 
put my finger on there and oh no that's not what i wanted to do i actually wanted to tip that back in there <laughs> like that will that flow yeah this is one way that you can empty an aquarium using uh, a pipe without using any like pumps or something like that now i might just let the water go back in there like that now the pipe has to be full of water otherwise the water won't flow so i just blew all the water out and now the water won't flow so what the experiment we're going to do is we're going to see what the flow rate is when the water level is at the highest point there so 100 percent and i'm going to fill up this little um 50 mil plastic container now you don't need to have a little tank you can use like a bucket or you could use like an ice cream container um something with square sides is best though uh that way well like yeah probably actually that doesn't doesn't really matter as long as you've got some container and you can put the sort of the height marks on it but this is a really good experiment for you to do yourself and you can use you don't need a 50 mil container you can use like a a quarter quarter cup from the kitchen or something like that uh i think a quarter a fifth of a cup cups 250 mil i think so a fifth of the cup is 50 mil anyway you can work it out doesn't really matter what the size is too much and well let's start with level 100 percent so level 100 percent on our table and i'm going to have a i'm just going to use my iphone as a stopwatch and are we ready here we go. So firstly, I'll get the flow rate happening. Okay, I did that much better that time. That time I didn't like almost drown myself. Put the phone here and ready, set, go. And I'm filling it up, filling it up, filling it up. Stop. All right, 4.53 seconds. 4.53 seconds. So the time is 4.53 seconds. I can work out the flow rate after. Now, I want to bring it down to, whoop, <laughs> I want to bring it down to, I'm emptying out the tube, I hope. I want to bring it down to 80%. And the quickest way to do that, the quickest way to do that, I think, is to do another bit of a siphon trick. So, I'm emptying it down to the 80% mark. This is the 90% mark. And we're almost at the 80% mark right there. That's the 80% mark there. Perfect. I'll just tip this back in. Zoop. And we're going to repeat. So this time, the level is 80%, eight zero, and I wonder how long that will take. Will it be the same time, or will it be a different time? What do you think? Face ID, whoa, okay, reset. <laughs> I don't know whether I like this experiment. Now, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if it's not touching the bottom. What does matter, what does matter is that the end of this hose is the same every single time. Start. And... Stop. 4.9. Ooh, 4.9 seconds. That's interesting. Took a little bit longer. 4.9 seconds actually took a little bit longer. So for a level of 80%, it took 4.9 seconds so it actually took a little bit longer let's pop that in there and let's bring it down to the 60 percent ah this is terrible things i do for science so this is the 70 percent level heading down to the 60%, oh, there we go. Yep, 60%, perfect. And 
put the end of the hose in again and get the phone. Oh, did you just see my passcode? Mm -hmm. Reset. And here we go. <coughs> Do you need to make sure it's not like touching the edge or anything like that? Because that would not work. Ready, set, go. And flowing, 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 flowing. Stop. 5.75. 5.75. So longer again. Ooh. 5.75. So our level this time of 60. 5.75. Whoa. So a level of 60. Time took 5.75. And let's bring it down to 40. You, you really want me to choke, don't you? Probably laughing your head off at poor Jacob. 60. This is 50. And... We're almost at 40. Oh dear. Okay, that's 40. 40%. And the time. Zip. We have to find out what the time is, don't we? I mean, that's what this experiment is about. We are reducing what we call the pressure head each time. We're reducing the pressure head each time. And so far, every time we've reduced it, the time has taken longer, which means the flow rate has decreased. The time's taken longer, and so the flow rate has decreased each time. Less pressure, less pressure, less flow rate. Hmm, that is perfect. And <laughs> just making sure we're working there. Good. Okay. I'm getting water everywhere. And do 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 do. And reset. And okay. Ready, set, go. One second, two second, three second, stop! 6.15, 6.15. So at 40%, it was 6.15 seconds. Hmm, each level, the time goes up. So the flow rate's going down. Now, oh, this bowl's sort of full now, so you know what, I'm just gonna do four values. Hopefully you're doing this yourself and you can do six values, but I'll just do four values, okay? So how do we how do we calculate the flow rate? How do we calculate the flow? It's millimeters per second. Now I did 50 millimeters. So I'm gonna to go to my calculator now and go to my calculator and I'm going to do 50 millimeters divided 50 millimetres divided by 4.53. 50 millimetres divided by 4.53 gives me 11 millimetres per second. So at 100% high, it was flowing at 11 millilitres every second. What about at 80%? 50 divided by 4.9 equals 10.2. Okay, the flow rate has gone down. What about at 60%? It was 50 divided by 5.75, which gives me 8.7. And the final one is 50 divided by 6.15. Oh, 50 divided by 6.15 equals, no, that's not right. 50 divided by 6.15 equals 8.1, 8.1 seconds. And so let's graph this and see what it looks like.
put his graph paper in. Lovely. And now, what what do you think would the flow rate would be if it was at zero? Well, if the flow rate was at zero, there would be zero flow. If the flow rate, if the height was at zero, if the height was at zero, there'd be zero flow. Now, what did we change? We changed the height. So we changed the height. So the height is the independent variable. And we'll put just that as a percentage. And it went from zero to 100. So there's 10 lines. So we'll go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Note that I've numbered the lines. I've numbered the lines, not the spaces. And our flow rate was our dependent. So our flow rate's our dependent, it's what we calculated, and it can go on the vertical because it's the dependent variable. And that was in milliliters per second. And I went up to 11. Hmm, it's a bit of a pain actually. So I might go up by twos. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. And so my first value was 100% height, so the maximum and the flow rate was 11. So I'll put a cross there. Okay, so there's my first point. For 80% it was 10.2. 80% was 10.2, so I'll put a cross there. The next one was 60% was 8.7. 60% and 8.7, which is about well, 9 about here and finally for 40 it was 8.1 40 percent for the height and 8.1 is about here and so in fact i'm actually going to put a zero zero because for zero height there'd be zero flow rate so i i would have actually liked to have done a few more points personally oh no 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 what am I doing? What am I doing? I've done a huge mistake. A huge mistake. Oh, I'm so glad that I did that mistake because it goes to show you that if you're not careful, if you're not careful, um, you really can make big mistakes in science. Because have a look. I sort of did these four results and then I said, oh, down here is zero height, zero, um, zero flow. But think about it for a moment. Think about it. Remember my little thing was down here? Well, zero height for the water level is actually here. But that's actually, this is actually lower, so there would actually be some flow rate. So in actual fact, this graph, I'm gonna use the ruler. I'm gonna use the ruler. This graph should actually I should actually follow those lines, okay? Zoop. Look at that, look at that. This, the actual graph, this is the incorrect one, this curvy one here. This straight line one here is the correct line. Because, because in actual fact, if the water level was down here, we would still get a flow rate of about six mil per second. That's what this graph is saying. I wonder whether that's true or not. Shall we test it? Shall we see whether the flow rate is actually six milliliters per second when this is like empty, virtually empty? Let's do it. I'll just go empty this out a bit. Not totally empty because we need a bit of water in it for it to flow. Okay, so this is as, this is as close to zero as I really can go and still get some water flowing. I hope I can get some water flowing. I'm looking for that weight. Where did that weight go? Where did I put it? Where was it? Ah, oh, it's actually in the container. <laughs> so somehow that needs to like <clears throat> hold that on the bottom somehow. This is gonna be very interesting. Science. Oh, yeah, that will work. And stopwatch. See what I'm talking about now? We actually do get flow rate because 
because of the fact because of the fact that the the jar is all the way down here okay so we need the stopwatch again and reset and set go okay it's flowing it's flowing all right look at that and stop okay 9.3 seconds 9.3 seconds so basically well it's not quite zero really it's probably it's probably 10 percent it's probably 10 percent so i'm going to put i'm going to put a level of 10 and i'm going to put a point of nine point a time of 9.3 let's go to the calculator okay and i'll do 50 mil divided by 9.3 equals 5.4 milliliters per second 5.4 milliliters per second let's come to the graph okay let's come to the graph and at 10 millimeters my graph predicted well my res my graph predicted that it would be flowing at around about 6.2 but in actual fact i calculated it about there so that's fairly close don't you think right that's where we actually calculated so that could actually be a point as well so there we go but what does this actually tell us this actually tells us the higher the pressure the greater the flow rate and in electricity the higher the voltage the greater the current can you see how the two are linked how the two are similar so if you've got more batteries in series you know, like 6 volts or 9 volts or 12 volts, well, if everything else is the same in a circuit, well, then the current will be higher, the higher the voltage you have. How good's that? <laughs> We're going to use this setup to look at the flow of water and the resistance. Okay, the flow of water and the resistance. So that's our next little practical. And I'm going to try and tip this water back. Oh, this could get, this could, this could get bad. Oh. Alright. I got some of it in there. Not much. Ah. Yeah. Water, water everywhere. Oh. Woohoohoo. I think it will be alright. I think it will be alright. Just. Just. Alright. So. I will. Ugh, there is water there. I might have to get a new one. And what we're going to do is change the length of the hose this time. Change the length of the hose. And I think by changing the length of the hose, that might change the resistance of the hose. So in this experiment, we're going to keep the water level height the same. And in the, I got it at exactly 50%. So that's pretty good, isn't it? Exactly 50%. Perfect. And I'll just tip that back. And I've got a hose that's exactly one metre long. Okay, so the hose is one metre long. If you don't believe me, well, actually, I'm sure you believe me, but I might just double check. It's little. It's, oh, no. Look. It's a metre long. <laughs> Unstretched. No, it is a metre long. All good. So, we'll have that at, that level at 50% each time. And we'll always hold the end at the same height. But this time we're going to be making the, the hose shorter and shorter. Are we ready? Are we steady? I'm not ready. I'm, I'm not steady either. But I'm pretty close. I'm going to make sure that the end's not being blocked by anything. Okay, I don't want that end to be touching the wall of the container because otherwise <clears throat> that will affect the experiment. Okay, I'm happy about that. I'm not happy about all the water though. Let's get the stopwatch. Stopwatch. And reset. Get some water. Now I've got to do it like this. Ready, set, go. And stop. Six seconds. Okay. So 
six seconds. I'll just tip that back. And I'll get, I'll lean that. Just make sure the water's out. So this time, the length of the hose is 100 centimetres. The length of the hose is 100 centimetres. It took six seconds, and we can calculate the flow rate later on. Let's chop off. How much should we chop off? Let's chop off 10 centimetres of hose. No! Yes. Chop! I've just chopped off 10 centimetres of hose, and we'll repeat. Reset. Oh. Ready, set, go! And stop! 5.43! Huh, 5.43, the time was shorter. So for a 90 centimetre long hose, the time was 5.43. That will mean that the flow rate has increased. Hmm. Let's chop off another 10 centimetres, shall we? Okay. I'm hoping that there's no air tube lovers out there who think I'm being a bit cruel. Snip. All right, there's another 10 centimetres gone. Let's have a look at the new flow rate. <laughs> okay, let's... Oh, this could be a bit tricky, actually. I think I've got a bit of a problem here, and I'll tell you what the problem is in... Oh, no, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. I've worked it out. Ready, set, go. Reset, stop. 5.1 seconds. 5.1 seconds. The time was even less. So for a length of 80 centimetres, for a length of 80 centimetres, the time was 5.1. There we go. Length of 80 centimetres, the time was 5.1. What about... 70 centimetres. Let's go to the other. Chop off another. I wonder what we can use all these little bits of hose for, I wonder. Now, what I was a bit concerned about before was, it's very important, it's very important that this hose here now is at the same height each time, that the end of the hose is at the same height, because we need this height difference to be the same. So what it means is I do have to pull it up a little bit, but that's okay. That's okay, as long as the hose doesn't come out of the water. So. Perfect, and go like this, start, and stop. 4.43. Hmm. So for a length of 70 centimeters, 4.43, wow. Four results is, oh no, let's do one more, one more, one more. I'll try and do one more. Okay, I'll give it a go. I'm not sure whether it will work or not, whether I can actually physically make this happen. We'll see in a tick. Can I actually get it to that height Oh, maybe, I'm not too sure. This is, there's no way we can do any more after this though, that's for sure. Ah, <laughs> uh, mm, mm, maybe, no, <laughs> the, let's come out of the, the water. So I can't do any more. I'm going to have to stick with these four values. And so let's give that a go at graphing it. And oh, I've got a nice piece of wet graph paper here. <sighs> let's see if I can do it. <laughs> your, your table's probably a mess as well. 
I do have to calculate the flow rate each time. So there's my values if you need to pause the video. There's my values. Hopefully you're using your own values. Because it's not, science is not very good just watching other people do it. I can tell you it's much more enjoyable if you're doing it yourself. So flow rate of 50 divided by 6. So the first flow rate was 8.3 millilitres per second. The next flow rate was 50 mil divided by 5.43 seconds, went up to 9.2. The next flow rate was 50 divided by 5.1 seconds, and it went up to 9.8. And then finally, the final flow rate was 50 mil divided by 4.43, and that put it at 11.2 seconds. So there, my flow rates there, and Let's go flow rate and length. I think I forgot to put the um, title on the last graph. Naughty. Flow rate and length. And so the length is what we changed. So the length is the independent variable. It's what you change. It goes down on the x-axis. And it went, we'll start at zero and we'll go up by tens. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. And what what affected, uh, or what did the change in the lengths affect? It was the flow rate. So the flow rate again goes on the uh, vertical in milliliters per second. And it went from up to 11.2. So I'm gonna go up by twos. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. For 100 centimetres, the flow rate was 8.3, which is here. For 90 centimetres, it was 9.2. So 90 centimetres, it was 9.2. Ooh. 9.2, which is... Actually, that's, that, that, that should be a little bit lower. There we go. For 90, it was 9.2, which is about here. For 80, it was 9.8. And for 70, it was 11.2, which is about here. So in this particular scenario, I'll extrapolate a little bit. Sorry, it's a bit messy, but it's because the paper's wet. That's why. What we can see is that the shorter the length, the greater the flow rate. The shorter the length, the greater the flow rate. Or if you increase the length, the flow rate decreases. Now, what does that tell us about electricity? Well, the longer the hose, the problem with the long hose is that the water rubs on the inside of the hose and that's what slows it down. That's resistance. And so the longer the hose, the greater the resistance. The longer the hose, the greater the resistance, and the less flow rate there is. So if you increase the resistance in a circuit, you will reduce the flow rate. And that, my friends, is Ohm's law in a nutshell. Ohm's law is the, highest, <coughs> the higher the pressure, the greater the flow rate. So the higher the pressure, the greater the flow rate. And the greater the resistance, the smaller the flow rate. That's why voltage, current, and resistance are all related according to Ohm's law. In fact, there's a, there's a really nice way to, um, to show this. And I'll show you this. It's, a, it's the V equals IR formula. But basically, we can write it as current, the, the flow of electricity, is equal to voltage over the resistance. And what that tells us is this. If you increase the voltage, so if the voltage goes up, then the current will go up, okay? If you increase the voltage, the current goes up. If you decrease the voltage, if you decrease the voltage, the current will go down. Or, or because it's over resistance, if you increase the resistance, the current will go down. So if you increase the electrical resistance, the current goes down. Or if you decrease the resistance, 
then the current will go up. So I hope that water analogy has helped you understand electricity just that little bit more. I'll see you next lesson. Hey, how good is that intro music, hey? My cousin, her son, Tim J. Tillica, he wrote that music for Tiny Science Lab, and uh, I think it's awesome. Very playful and fun. Anyway, uh, understanding electricity, lesson seven, parallel circuits. Now, in a previous video or lesson, we looked at series circuits. So let's just Let's just set up a quick series circuit, shall we? Uh, with a number of light globes. We'll put a switch. We'll put a switch. No, let's leave the switch out. <laughs> let's get a few globes happening and we'll make a really simple series circuit. Now remember, a series circuit has only one pathway. Um, so the, the basic, the most basic of series circuits is where there's only one uh, load. And in this case, this particular globe is the load and so the current goes around in the circuit and it loses its electrical energy in that little wire there that's where it loses its electrical energy now let's add another globe in series and let's see what happens i think you should know what will happen hmm what's your prediction to what will happen to the brightness of the globes we've done oh it's a lot dimmer, isn't it? Hmm. Why is that? Well, it's because there's more resistance and so there's less current flowing. Because now the electrons have to push through not just one little wiggly wire, but two thin li little wiggly wires. Now what about a third globe in series? So a third globe in series. What's your prediction? Um, dun, 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 dun. Let's find out. And a third globe in series. Ooh, very dim indeed. Um, three times the resistance, and so the current is three times less than the original. And there's a little bit of a problem with, well, there's lots of problems with circuits like this, but if I was to um, unscrew one of these light globes, they all go out because there's only one pathway, and so if there is an issue in that pathway, um, there is a problem. But today's lesson is parallel circuits, parallel circuits. So keep your, keep your light globes out, and we're going to set up a parallel circuit. Now, a parallel circuit has more than one pathway for the electrons to take, okay? So it's got more than one pathway. So we'll just start with the simple series circuit, but now, what we're going to do is we're going to add another globe in parallel. What will happen? What's your prediction when I connect that? Well, look at that. Now I've got two globes and they're just as bright as each other. So now the electricity is, how is it going? It's going from the positive here and it can now actually uh, split up and there's two pathways for it to take and then it comes back to the battery. So let's say, well, I can actually measure the current. If we want to measure current, we simply use an ammeter and we put an ammeter in series. Okay, put an ammeter in series. And I can see that the current is 0.6 amps. 0.6 amps leaving the battery. 0.6 amps leaving the battery. And I can tell you right now, of that 0.6 amps, 0.3 is going through that globe and 0.3 is going, going through, that, through that globe. And then they, the electricity recombines and so you have 0.6 amps flowing back to the battery like that. Now what about if we add a third globe in series? Let's add a third globe in series. In series? No, a third globe in parallel. Of course, what was I thinking? And I'll just use the tours here. And look, just as bright as before. Well, maybe a little tiny bit dimmer. And how about I unscrew one of the globes? I'll unscrew them. Oh, this time I unscrew it and the other ones stay on. See? 
When the globes are in parallel, um, what happens to one doesn't affect the others. So that's a real advantage of parallel circuits. Now I might just quickly unscrew them while we have a look at the sheet and see what we need to do. So it says, let's set up some parallel circuits. And the first circuit that we'll set up is this one. There we go. So make sure you're setting up that. And I will draw that circuit for us here. And what's it look like? Well, we've got a positive, a negative, a positive, and a negative. And then it comes ooh, sort of like a, a line like that. And I put the light globe here and that one there. That's the first light globe. And I can put the other light globe here. That's the second light globe. Now, if you want, I can just trim it up there nicely. And so that's the circuit for, um, this is the drawing for this particular circuit. And remember the long line is the positive and the short lines are the negative. So it goes positive, negative, positive, negative. And the electricity flows from the positive to the negative. So it flows all, but then half of it will go through that one and half of it through will go through that one. As long as, as long as their resistance is the same. Now, if their resistances are different, well then the electricity will split up um, in a different ratio. Anyway, the electricity will come back, the electricity will come back to the battery like that. So that's the first, um, that's the first circuit you can set up and draw, and you can draw it in that box right there. The second one, Let's just add a light, a third light globe in parallel. Okay, so let's just add a third light globe in parallel like this. And now we've got three light globes in parallel. And I might not cheat a little bit, but I, I want to say ink. So <laughs> you need to redraw it, but I just need to add a third globe in parallel. And again, now the current will we've got a higher current flowing because there's more pathways and because there's more pathways there's less resistance in the circuit oh uh oh uh oh 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 that's interesting did you see what happened then they sort of all just died and the reason is those batteries are going flat in fact with three globes in parallel the batteries will go flat three times faster so Oh, they are now, so maybe it's best to put a switch on it so that you don't drain your batteries too quickly. If I pop those back in, there we go. But I might just insert a switch so that I don't use up all my chemical potential energy from my battery too quickly because that would be a real shame and a waste of batteries. So there we go, now I've got a switch. Now, interestingly, I have put the switch in series with the um, battery. So the, the switch is in series because all the electricity goes through the, the switch, but the three light globes are in parallel. Now, what else could I do? Well, I could actually, let's remove the third light globe and we could even put a motor in parallel. See, that's, we can actually put a motor in parallel. And so I'm using my, hmm, I might use my fibers. I'll use my fibers nice and long, like this. Click, click, click. And if I put that on there like that, okay. Woo, see, all three go on. But those batteries are now doing three times the amount of work because they're actually powering three things. Now those fibers did remind me of something and I'll show you another way to set up the parallel circuits quite nicely. And that is to actually use the fibers like that so that they're nice and long. And I'll just connect them with two tours. So there we go. So we've got two fibers and I could have actually just gone, hey, globe in parallel globe in parallel, globe in parallel, 
but don't forget, <laughs> don't forget we are um, flattening that battery three times quicker. So what was the final one that I did? Uh, it was with the motor, wasn't it? So you can even put the motor like that if we want. I'll just take that off and, oh, hang on, here we go. On you go, and, and click him on, whee! Whoa! Mm, bye bye. Um, and so the third circuit that I want you to draw is the motor. Easy. Look at that. Okay, there's the third circuit. Now, on the worksheet, it says, what about globes in parallel? And it actually wants us to put the ammeter in and take some measurements. So let's do that. Let's do that. And so we'll put an ammeter in series because that will measure the current. I'm going to use a switch. Okay, so let's put a switch in series as well. And then we will run our, I think I might run a, a fourer and a fiver, something like that. And I'll put another fiver like this and pop my switch to it. And then I can add my first light globe, my first light globe. And that's my first circuit, so I better draw that. Um, oh, got the eraser. Let's get rid of that. Beautiful, nice and clean. And so there's room there in this box to draw this circuit. So how are you going with circuits and circuit keys? Hopefully quite good. Hopefully yours are a little bit neater than mine. Mine are a little bit messy. So I've only got two, there we go, I've got two batteries. And let's go to the um, ammeter, like that. It's in series. It's got a switch so that I don't flatten my batteries. And then I'll come that, that take that down to my light globe. So I've got one light globe, which technically isn't in parallel, but let's look at the current flowing. The current flowing is 0.3 amps. So the current flows with one light globe is 0.3 amps. One light globe, 0.3 amps. Now you can draw the second circuit. You can draw the second circuit with two light globes right there, okay? And that's a piece of cake. Um, the switch is, is happy there, that's fine. But I'll add a second globe in parallel. And when I turn it on, way the current goes to 0 0.6 amps. So it started off at 0 0.3, I added a second globe and it's 0 0.3. I wonder what the current will go to with a third one. And so you can add a third globe in parallel and you 0 0.8 0 0.8 now you might say hang on 0 0.3 0 0.6 shouldn't it go to 0 0.9 well technically yes it should but these batteries can only put out a certain amount of current and you know this is sort of reaching their maximum and so that they're trying, to, they're trying to put out as much energy as they can and they just can't keep up. That's why it's 0 0.8 and, 0 po and not 0 0.9. So there we go. Nobody's perfect, okay? Give, give these batteries a little bit of a, a fair go. Now, what's the analogy to water um, with a parallel circuit? Is there an analogy? Absolutely. And I've got a barrel. I've got a, a picture of a barrel here. I thought, oh, I'd love to have a small barrel to do this. The closest I could get was a, a little can. And I brought this back from Japan a few years ago. They've got vending machines everywhere in Japan. And lots, they love their, uh, like their ice cold coffees and lots of different shaped cans for their coffee. This was the Kilimanjaro blend. It was not bad from memory. Um, but this can is a little bit too small for purposes. And so I've uh, got a, um, like a, a fish bowl. And 
And one way to empty the fish bowl is to use a siphon. So I could put this siphon in and I could suck on that like the last lesson and you'd laugh because I'd get a mouthful of dirty fish water and I'd be spitting it out and the water would flow. Now that would represent a series circuit. Now let's say I wanted to speed up the emptying process, right? Let's say I wanted to speed up the emptying process. Well, one thing I could do is replace that hose with a wider hose. See that? A wider hose has got a bigger diameter. It's got less resistance. And so if I sucked out the water, it would flow more quickly because there's less resistance to the flow. What about if I added a second hose? Ah, oh, would that speed things up? What about if I added a hose like this? Yeah, would that speed up the process? And then maybe even a third hose like this? Would that speed up the process? Three hoses instead of one? Absolutely not. Because these are in series and these would become a long hose with lots of resistance and so the flow rate would go down. That makes sense, doesn't it? Because they're long, um, there's lots of friction from the sides of the um, hoses on the water and so that would slow the water down. But there is a way to use three hoses to empty this quicker and that is if I use one hose like that and then I get a second hose and I pop it in there like that. Oh, see? Then I'd have two hoses emptying it. Or if I got a third hose and I got it siphoning, that would empty it much, much quicker. And so this is a little bit like a circuit which is in parallel. These three light globes are, in fact, emptying the battery. These three hoses are, in fact, emptying this tank. And that's why my poor little batteries over here went flat, because I had three things emptying it very, very quickly. So that's our analogy of the parallel circuit. I hope you find that helpful and slightly interesting. So Ohm's Law, um, we've actually can do a little bit of a calculation. And what we'll say is, let's say that the voltage is three volts. Okay, so the voltage is three volts. So Ohm's Law, Ohm's Law says that well, it says that current, and this is the best way to learn it, equals voltage over the resistance. Now, if the voltage is 3 volts, 1.5 plus 1.5, 3, and the resistance is, um, let's say each one of, um, let's say, well, this is, a, this is a little bit tricky actually. If I have one globe, if I have one globe in series like that, then I can actually work this out for you. That was 0.3 amps, 0.3 amps. And so that was, if that's three divided by, or no, this is, my, this, this is really testing my mathematics here. <laughs> if I go um, 0.3, oh yeah. If I go the resistance of 10, so I've got three volts over 10 ohms, that's actually a current of 0.3 amps. Okay, and so that's how we can actually use Ohm's law. Three volts, 10 ohm resistor, and a current of 0.3 amps. Now if I was to add another globe in series, another globe in series like this, well, what happens to the resistance? It doubles, and so the current goes down by a factor of two. Now, what about if I add them in parallel? Well, here's the thing. Now there's two pathways. There's two pathways, so half the resistance. The resistance halves, and so the current goes up by two, and that's why it's 0.6. So this, this resistance here is actually five ohms, see this? And three over five is 0.6 amps. Phew, my maths came back to me right at the last moment. 
Now, you're, you're saying, mm, I don't think it did actually. Anyway, what are some practical applications of series and parallel circuits? Well, back in the old days, Christmas trees used to be a real pain in the neck. Maybe your parents might remember, but you used to set up the Christmas tree lights and you turn them on, and then usually after a few hours, they'd all go out. Every single light would go out. And you're like, oh no! And it was because the globes were all in series, right? The globes are all in series, and they are the old school type of globes, okay? They are old school type of globes, which were little wiggly wires, and one of the little, little wiggly wires would burn out and they would all go out. And so what you actually had to do what you had to do is you had to go or go to each globe and unscrew it and then try putting in a good globe and hope that when you screwed in the good globe, they would all come back to life because you'd find the bad one there. Your parents might remember that. It was very, very painful. You don't have to suffer that pain anymore because um, globes these days are mainly made from LEDs. Okay, so globes these days are mainly LED globes, and those LED globes um, don't have the same issues as the globes with the wiggly wiggly wires. Okay, there's no wiggly wires in an LED globe. But I do want to show you something. Um, I've got a power pack here. I've got a not power pack. I've got a power board. A power board here, and now. I've cut off the end to make it safe, and I've thrown the end into the garbage can so that no one can plug it into the wall or anything like that. But I wanna show you what's inside this power board. Very, very interesting, but you do need to keep in mind, here's the battery pack, which, um, and then we've got two um, long things that come off like that. And remember when I pack, plug something in there like that, oh, nice and bright, plug something in there, nice and bright. Uh, plug something in. I'm not plugging it in very well. There we go, that's better. Plug it in nice and bright. Plug it in nice and bright. Okay, remember that? Well, let's have a look at what's in here. I'll crack it open. And have a look. Have a look. Basically, basically, I'll just hide this out of the way because it's a little bit confusing. Um, it's got two straight long wires. It's actually got a third one, which is the earth, but don't just ignore that. That's just like a safety one. Can you see the similarities between this parallel circuit, this parallel circuit, and the circuit that you get in your, the circuit that you get in your power board? You see, when you plug in your fan, it plugs in across those two, and electricity starts flowing. Then you can plug in a heater, and electricity starts flowing. You plug in a TV, and electricity starts flowing. And in actual fact, every single time you plug something extra in, more and more electricity flows. And sometimes, you can have so much electricity flowing that the wires get hot and start a fire. That's why it's got a little, um, it's got a resettable breaker. And when, it, when the electricity, um, the current is too high, it trips and then you unplug things and then you can click it back and it will work again. So that's why you shouldn't overload power boards because power boards, if they're overloaded, can too much electricity flows and it can produce too much heat and that can actually cause a fire. But you can see how they're in parallel, can't you? See that? That's in parallel, just like that. Oh, well, hopefully you've enjoyed the lesson and I'll see you soon. Bye for now. Lesson eight, magnets. Now, in your set, you should have three magnets in here. You should have two ceramic bar magnets, which are blue and red, and they've got an S and an N on them, standing for south and north. Um, and ceramic magnets, mm, they're not that strong. Okay, they're not, they're not particularly strong, are they? Um, you can pull them apart fairly easily. 
Um, but they certainly are able to show that uh, like poles repel, so a north and a north pole repel, and that a north and a south pole attract. So they're not <clears throat> totally useless. But in your set, you've actually got a much stronger magnet, which I have encased in some 3D uh, printing shell, and it's a super magnet. Now, what you'll see is the repulsion is a lot stronger, and the attraction is a lot stronger. Now, the reason I've put this in the um, plastic is that this will slam into other pieces of iron, nickel or cobalt, the three main magnetic metals, and it will shatter quite easily. Um, also, in that casing, it's a lot harder to get lost. But one reason that I included these wheat bar magnets is that you can actually use them to make sure that if that's a south pole, if the blue is south and it's attracting to the red, then that red is a north pole. Now, hopefully I didn't put the magnets the wrong way in your sets. <laughs> and so hopefully I've done it correctly, but it's a good way to test it. So where are magnets found around your house? Well, if you have a look at our fridge, there's a whole bunch of like fluid plumbing magnets and oh well, look on time septic services these are they've got magnets on the back and well look see it's uh, a magnetic substance it's pretty difficult to actually work out what part is north and what part is south on these magnets in fact they're actually made up i think of hundreds of little tiny sort of impregnated magnets and so the north and the south is actually quite difficult to um, tell apart what else has got magnets in your house. Um, well, loudspeakers we looked at earlier, this little Bluetooth um, sound machine, it's got a permanent magnet in it, um, in the speaker itself. So uh, the use, it's a loudspeaker, and description, it changes electricity into sound. I found this little um, toy of mine. It's an inflatable tube guy. Maybe you've seen these at like car yards or something. And they've got fans down the bottom and the fan blows air into them and they're like, woo, woo. So inflatable tube guy. Now it's got a motor and I can assure you that that particular motor will have magnets in them. Many, many motors have got permanent magnets in them. This, this is a little motor system, but interestingly, I've set it up that you don't put electricity in there, you actually move it and it generates electricity. So often um, battery operated motors um, work the other way. That is that if you turn them manually, they will actually generate electricity. And there's a, the motor there being used as the generator. It will contain, or it does contain, some permanent magnets in there. Uh, this um, minion, solar, solar power minion, if we sh shine some light on him, he will tilt backwards and forwards, go backwards and forwards. Now, he doesn't have a permanent magnet in him, He's got what's called an electromagnet. And an electromagnet becomes magnetic when you pass electricity through it. But it's definitely um, magnetic. And let me show you that, let me show you that. If I have a battery here, I've got this funny looking device here. It's called a solenoid, a solenoid. And it's got a spring there and a, a bar so that it can click up and down and I'm clicking it up and down just by pushing it with my finger. But if I connect it to a battery, you have a look at this, okay? I'll connect it to the battery and you watch the solenoid. Woo! Look at that. Look at the, see how quickly it clicks down? You can do a lot of things with solenoids. In your car, if 
if you the, the the doors that lock automatically each door has got its own little solenoid um where else are sol solenoids are used in a lot of places you can use solenoids to turn water taps on and off gas taps on and off you can use them to what else well you could use this to feed your goldfish you know if you if you um put a uh, like a dish of food on there, and then you sent a signal, it could um, feed your goldfish, or even it could, you could even have like a, a hopper with some little dog dog foodie things in there, and you could use this to automatically feed your dog if you wanted to. So solenoids are very, very important, and they're basically electromagnets, uh, coils of wire, which you pass electricity through, and when the electricity goes through them, they become magnetic and we're going to be making an electromagnet this lesson so i'm very excited about that old school nokia um, phone you might have heard of a nokia brick phone it's got a loudspeaker it's got a magnet in it it's got a microphone that's got a magnet in it it's got a motor in it that causes it to vibrate Brrr, that will have a motor in it so each um, motor will have uh, magnets in it as well. So, really good. Magnets are very, and magnetism, are very important to our everyday modern life. So, what are some observations about magnets? Well, well, if you, well, they come in lots of different shapes and sizes, that's for sure. Here's a U-shaped magnet. It's got a north and a south pole. This is a bar magnet. It's got a north and a south pole. This little ball is actually magnetic as well. So, boop. And so, I don't think it's a round magnet in there. It's probably just like a little flat magnet, but we can say you can get magnets that are shaped like little balls. Um, is another type of bar magnet. And I've actually seen magnets made. I've actually seen magnets like this made went to a guy's place and he had a mold and he poured in the metal powder and he had a like a, a hydraulic piston that compressed it so he compressed the metallic powder which had a glue in it and then he pulled out the bar and then he put it in this giant coil of wire and pressed the button it passed electricity and it magnetized it so you can magnetize iron you can magnetize iron nickel and cobalt now this nail it's probably not a magnet now. Now to test to see whether it's a magnet now, what I can do is I can get some pins. Now I had some pins over here. And if I put the pile of pins on the table, well, if I was to bring a magnet to them, I could pick up the pins. Look at this, see? Zoop. Now, bar magnets, permanent magnets are always magnetic. Electromagnets are only magnetic when only magnetic when you pass electricity in and out of them. So I'm just going to see whether this nail is magnetic. No, it's not. It's not. But in a way, I, I guess I could sort of make it magnetic, or uh, I could actually have the magnetic field pass through it. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to attach the nail to some very strong magnets. And, whoa, look at that. The sort of the magnetic field passes through that iron. Iron is very good at amplifying or making magnetic fields stronger. And if I pull away the magnet, look, they all drop. <laughs> I love it. So, magnets all have a north and south pole. Okay, I promise you. All magnets have a north and south pole. That is... Um, 100% guaranteed. I could actually bring these magnets under this table, I wonder. I wonder. Oh, oh no. Oh, see a little bit of movement there. It's quite a thick table, so the magnetic field doesn't really go through it very well. In fact, it's like table and then another piece of wood, so it's about that thick. Um, I could probably, probably put the pins on my hand like this and Look at this. Can make the I can make the pin stand on edge. How good is that? Can you see that? 
<laughs> All right, oh, take that pin off. Also, the closer, oh, they come in different strengths. Magnets come in different strength. The closer you are, the closer you are, the stronger the magnetic field. The further you are away, the weaker the magnetic field. So, nice and close, the magnetic field is nice and strong. Now, we're going to try and, I'm going to try and show you the magnetic field lines around a magnet. I'll just move, I'll just move these pins out of the way. And this is a really, these are like lots of little strong magnets and not a good idea to slam them together because they'll break. But I'm going to put them in the middle of this um, piece, of, piece of plastic like that. And I'm going to put a piece of card on there like that. And I've got some iron powder. And so I might see what happens if I shake some iron powder on two the paper. Let's see if we can map map the electric the magnetic field a little bit. Tap 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 I'll show you on my I'll take a photo on my phone in a tin so that you can see this. It's a bit like cooking with salt or pepper. And I might just film it with this, and then I'll tap it, and you can see the magnetic field lines. Okay. There you go. Tap, 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 tap. Oh, look at some of those beautiful lines around the the magnet. See those circular lines there? The lines of the magnetic field. Look at that. They extend out into space. They extend out into space. Beautiful. Now, if I was to draw that, and I will draw it, because you need to draw it, and <clears throat> if I draw my bar magnet, and I'll put a ooh, north and a south, the magnetic field lines go something like this. They leave the surface at 90 degrees, and then far away from the magnet, they're sort of weaker. Closer to the magnet, they're stronger. And they'll head out like so. Okay? So the magnetic field lines look something like that. And scientists like to give things directions. And so we actually say that they, the field lines go from north to south. Okay? By definition, we say that the field lines go from north to south. So that's... Um, the field lines around one magnet, well, it's sort of like many magnets combined to one. And what I'll do is I'll, oh no, it's sort of attracted the magnet onto it still. I'm going to have to pull the magnet off. <laughs> and now I'll take that paper and I'll funnel, funnel the iron filings back in. That's beautiful. And what I'll do now is two bar magnets, two bar magnets, and we'll have a look around, look at the um, magnetic field around two bar magnets. Oh, I'll try yours. I'll try the ones that come in the set and we'll see what happens. Okay, I'm going to actually put the north and the south together, but I don't want them to touch. Okay, so the north and the south are close, but they're not quite touching. And this is not, going to be nearly as strong so I'm hoping it's strong enough that we can see some type of lines oh it just looks like a, a dark mess at the moment doesn't it but 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 and if I go tap whoa that was awesome that was totally awesome it's actually a lot easier if I draw it draw it for you um, so that I can show you what you're seeing. Okay, I'll show, you, I'll show you what you're seeing. Makes it a lot easier to see what you're seeing here. And we've got two little magnets. Zoop, 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 zoop. Another one here. I'm a fantastic drawer, you see. 
north, south, north, south. And what we actually see is we sort of see these lines that line up between it like that. But then, but then, we go like that, a bit like that, a bit like that, a bit like that, and then that goes out there like that. And remember they go from north to south, north to south, north to south, um, north to south, and north to south like so, and north to south. So that's what it looks like when we put the two magnets north to south together. It's a little bit harder to see it with the iron filings. That's why I drew it for you. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we're gonna make our own little electromagnets and you will need, you will need from your sets, um, the same wire that you use to make your loudspeaker. So you'll need the red wire. Hopefully you haven't thrown that away. If you have, where can you get um, where can you get this sort of wire from? Well, you can if you were to pull apart a loudspeaker, you could get the wire out of the loudspeaker. Um, you might have some thin electrical wiring that you can use, but hopefully, hopefully you've got this um, piece of wire left over. So I tied it up nicely before. Uh, you'll need one other thing, and that's a nail. You will need to go find yourselves a nail from somewhere. Um, your workshop, your garage, your neighbour. Um, not a toenail, not a fingernail, like a nail that you hit with a hammer. Bang, bang, bang. And um, electromagnets actually really, really quite easy to make. What you need to do is I'm just pulling this out without tying knots in it. Okay, so there we go, and I'm uncoiling it. And remember the red stuff is just like a plastic, that it's a plastic coating. So I'll put about 10 centimeters hanging out there like that. And then I'm just going to wrap the wire around the end of the nail. Okay, wrapping the wire around the end of the nail like this. The more turns, the better. The more turns, the better, because each turn will be magnetic. And so if you do two turns, it will be twice as strong as one turn magnet. A 50 turn electromagnet will be 50 times stronger than a one turn electromagnet. So the more turns, the better. But there's a few little issues. Um, the, the more the current, the greater the current, the greater the current, the greater the magnetic field strength. But the longer the wire, the more the resistance, and that will reduce the current. So there's a few sort of complications when you're making an electromagnet. So just start simple and just actually just like make something, okay? And I'll just test to see whether it's not picking up any pins. Pins are great to pick up with magnets. If you don't have any pins, you could go get a stapler, right? And with a stapler, you can pick up, make some great things to pick up as well. Okay, so staplers are great at making little iron um, things to pick up with magnets as well. So that's what you can use if you don't have uh, some pins. Hopefully you've got some pins or a stapler. Now we'll have to power this. And so I'm going to use a battery pack I'm gonna put a, a momentary switch in there because, because it's a series circuit and because that wire doesn't have a lot of um, resistance, it actually it's actually a short circuit. And a short circuit, um, a lot of current flows and that, that flattens your batteries very, very quickly. So it's best, it's best to put a switch on so that you can turn it on and off easily when you want it turned on and off, okay? So we can connect one end. Oh, I'm just folding over the ends a little bit to make sure that the um, alligator clip can click it nicely. 
like that, that's good. And I'll grab that side like so. And then I can connect it to my thing. So I've got a nice little series circuit. And when I press the button, electricity will flow. So no pins. I press the button. Whoa! Look at them all. I've made like a little crane. Woo! How good's that? So I can pick them up, bring them over here, drop them, come over here, pick them up. Oh, hang on. That's interesting. You know how I talked about um, flattening your batteries really quickly? Well, this really does flatten your batteries quickly and it warms up too. It can get hot. So, oh, look at that. Do not have it on for long because those batteries will get flattened super quick look at this I can move the whole pile across yeah those batteries really really will um, go flat quickly what are some ways to um, reduce that well we've always been putting our batteries in series so far if we want to increase the voltage but you can actually, there is a way to put your batteries in parallel. It's a little bit tricky. Okay, it's a little bit tricky. But what I'm going to do, or oh, can I actually do it? It's not easy at all actually to put these in parallel. Um, I'll have to give that some more thought. I might put them in series and see what happens because we can actually, I've actually asked you to design an experiment to see how different current affects the magnetic field strength. Well, if we if we want to do that, we actually have to measure the current. So I'm going to pop the ammeter in there so I can measure the current. And to measure the strength of the magnetic field, we could actually see how many like pins it picks up. That's why I'm one way to determine the strength of the magnetic field. So if the current is zero, if the current is zero, it doesn't appear to have any magnetic field strength. So we can say zero current equals zero magnetic field strength, right? Zero current, zero magnetic field strength. Now, this time, I'm going to press the... Oh, I didn't click my end of the wire on. Let's go again. This time, whoa, it shoots, it shoots, shoots up to two amps. That's really strong. That's that's really high. I need to reduce the current by putting in some resistance. So I'm going to try putting a light globe in as some resistance. This will really reduce the um, the current flowing. The battery won't get flat nearly as quickly. Okay, so now I've only got 0.3 amps flowing. But with such a small current, it's hardly magnetic at all. Hmm, Houston, we've got a problem. What am I going to do? I need more current flowing, but I don't want a short circuit. Um, I might try. What will happen if I put in this little LED? I, I actually don't know. Let's see what happens. Oh, it's actually got quite a high resistance because not much current flows, so that definitely won't pick anything up. Okay, so that's not going to work. What else might work? Um, I could use one of the rods as a variable resistor. The problem is I'm already using my alligator clips for the electromagnet. So if, if I had extra um, alligator clips, then I could solve that problem, but I don't. So what do I do? Hmm, have to try and MacGyver something. MacGyver is a famous TV show where a guy uses like random bits of equipment to make stuff happen. What about if I was to hold that there? And, oh, that's quite low too. I'm gonna hold it a bit lower here. Mm, oh dear, oh dear. How I asked you to do an experiment that's really Difficult to do. Yes, I have. I have asked you to. What about the motor? 
What happened if I put the motor in series? Oh, in actual fact, if I grab the motor, it actually goes up to 0.6 amps. Oh, okay. So 0.6 amps, and that actually does pick up one pin. So that's one way to, so if it's 0.6 amps, it picks up one pin. Very interesting. 0.6 amps. Now the only way to do that is for me to hold the motor. So, there we go, I've got two readings now. I've got two readings. I've got zero amps is zero pins. 0.6 amps is one pin. 0.6 amps is one pin. Okay, I've got another idea got another idea pull pull the battery out all right maybe you'd already thought of this idea sometimes you've just got to <clears throat> try a few different things this time I'm just going to put one battery connect the hold the battery like this put the battery like that I need someone to help me here let's try another hand you might need to ask someone to help because somehow I've got to, I'll have to pull out that switch because I, I don't have enough hands to press the switch. So I'll pull out the switch and I'll put the connecting like that. And this time the switch will just be me doing that. Whoa, but it really goes up past two amps. It goes beyond the extent of the ammeter. So that's not going to work either. Wow. So... Really, really I've got two readings and that's about it. So let's just go for the two amps. Let's just go for the two amps with one battery and that picks up. How many will that pick up? Whoa! That picks up a whole heap because it's more than two amps that are flowing. Well, if you find a solution to this problem for me, um, a way to use your equipment um, that I've sent you without extra um, alligator clips and leads to try and get a range of currents flowing through your electromagnet, please let me know. And uh, that way I might even modify the, this video so that um, students can do it in the future. Can you solve the problem? Because I don't think I've been able to. Anyway... I hope uh, that you understand a little bit more about magnets and I uh, look forward to seeing you next lesson. Bye for now. Lesson 9, electric motors. Now, it's fair to say that I'm a little bit nervous about this lesson because I'm going to attempt to make an electric motor with you from our set. And oh, I really do hope I can get it to spin, otherwise it will be a major, major embarrassment. But anyway, electric motors. Now there is an electric motor in your set, which we've used already, and um, electric motors change electricity into kinetic energy or moving energy. And electric motors are very important to our society. Probably in your household, probably the most important electric motor is in your fridge because it drives a compressor to move heat around to keep your food cold. A very important um, electric motor is also in your washing machine and your, oh, what else might be in your hair dryer. But this is, this is a new type of motor found in the Fisher Pykel Smart Drive. And it's actually only part of the motor. The outside part contains a whole bunch of magnets. And what this motor does to make it spin is it, it uses electromagnets, you know, really quite powerful electric, electromagnets. And so it actually pulsates the current. And so the magnetic field travels around like this and that sort of pushes the, the, um, the motor around. And this is actually very similar to this motor, which is a wheel slash motor, which is found in a hoverboard. Hoverboards actually have motors. If I was to open this up, it would look an awful lot like that. Quite heavy because there's a lot of copper 
and quite a lot of magnets as well. Um, so if you're ever after some insulated copper wire, I'm not too sure how to open this thing. It's not that easy. I've taken the screws out, but oh, it's, it's solid. Yeah. Um, this is an electric motor out of a microwave. It uh, powers a fan. In fact, you might have a fan in the bathroom to keep the, get the steam out of the room. Uh, there'll be a fan like this in your oven to sort of like blow hot air around. Um, hmm. This is a fan out of a computer and it's driven by an electric motor and it's to keep the, the, the computer cool. This one's from an electric drill and again it changes electricity into kinetic energy and there's a gearbox in there but that's the motor part itself. And this is an electric motor out of a scooter. Um, changes electricity into kinetic energy. And it's a 24 volt direct current motor operating at 100 watts, so 100 joules per second. So lots of different places around the house where electric motors can be found and you can jot some of those things that I've just said. Now, electric motor, uh, requires um, a force and that force comes from what we call the motor effect which we looked at when we did a loudspeaker. Now quite a few years ago I made a um, fun little video on my Make Science Fun YouTube channel. Uh, Make Science Fun YouTube channel is, it's, it's got a few good videos but mostly they're hmm, so-so. But I think this one's a good one. It's called an electromagnetic swing and it very clearly shows the direction of force on a current carrying wire in a magnetic field. And that's basically what a motor is. A motor is, and I've got a big model here just to sort of show this a little bit, but basically motors use magnetic fields and there's an example. This is just a model of a magnetic field, like so. Um, and a magnet on this side. So motors have got a lot of magnets in them. And so there's two magnets there. And they've got coils of wire which conduct electricity. And so when the electricity, okay, well, what's a better way of doing this? This is like, this would probably be easiest for me. Oh yeah. When the electricity is flowing towards you through this part of the um, rotor and the magnetic field is going that way, this will experience a force up. So that will cause rotation. And this one here, this one here will experience, well, I've got to get the currents the right way. <laughs> this one here will experience a force down. And so we get rotation like that. So for our motor, we're going to need um, a coil, which we can connect to electricity. We're going to need a magnet, and we're going to have to have some wires to pass electricity through the coil. So let's try, let's try and get a motor working. <laughs> so come to your sets and there'll be a, a thing that says motor. That's going to be the, the board that we're using. Uh, and there's some um, sandpaper. There's two copper um, pieces of wire. Now, this this is pure copper. This copper here, these two shorter pieces, don't have any enamel on them. They're not coated with plastic. So we can, I can show you that. I can show you that. So if you grab your power pack, okay, it's good to explore. It's good to explore and it's good to, um, when I say something, just to double check to make sure I haven't said the wrong thing, which I guess occasionally happens, sometimes. There you go. <laughs> I'll get my two alligator clips. I love these alligator clips with the click connectors on them. It really, really makes life so much better. And you're probably saying, hmm, that teacher needs to get a better life. Hmm, okay, point taken. And so let's connect the <clears throat> alligator clips to here. So I've got like a conductivity circuit. If I put those, yes, very good. 
And remember I said that there's no plastic on this wire, so therefore if I clip there and clip there, if there's no plastic, it should light up. Ta-da! Correct, this is bare wire, bare wire. Now, as opposed to, and you can get it out, please, this long piece, this big piece of golden copper, okay? It is enameled wire, and this is the one that we're going to be making our motors from in this lesson and hopefully the motors will spin so i'm just unwrapping it a little bit and then sort of pulling it apart so it doesn't knot and what i'll show you is that if i connect to one part of the wire there and i connect to another part of the wire the light does not come on that's because the wire is coated with a plastic which is an insulator so if I want the wire, if I want the electricity to flow, what I need to do is I need to use my alligator clip, not my alligator clip, my sandpaper, and I need to sand off the plastic. Okay, so now if I'm sanding off the plastic, the enamel it's called, it's enameled wire. And you might ask, why do, why do they put an enamel coating on the wire? Why don't they just use bare wire so for example and i'll tell you this this wire here this is recycled wire this i actually have pulled apart washing machines and the the electric electrical this wire that comes in our sets actually comes from old washing machines oh pats pats for us <laughs> now it's got to be uh, enameled because we need the electricity to go around in a circle to make a strong electromagnet if the, if the wire wasn't enameled, it would just like go straight through and it wouldn't actually go around in a circle. So that's why it's enameled. And I think I've removed the enamel. So now I'll clip, clip there. And if I clip to another part of the wire here, yes. See how the, see how the wire now I make, makes contact? Very, very good. So, the first and the most important thing is that we need to make what's called the rotor. The rotor is the part that spins, okay? The rotor is the part that spins. And if I get a whiteboard that I didn't clean from last lesson, but I have cleaned now, then the rotor is going to look something like this. It's going to have, it's made from one piece of wire Got an end that pokes out there like that. And then we're going to wrap it around like the shaft of a whiteboard marker or piece of plastic tubing. And we're going to go around quite a few times. And then we poke out that way. So our rotor is going to look something like that. And so the electricity is going to go in and going to go around and around and around and around and around and, around and then go out that way. And so that means we do need to sand, okay, we do need to sand that part, and we need to sand that part, okay, because we need to make those two parts conductive. And I'm going to use that um, whiteboard marker, that's about a good size, that's a, it's about a centimeter, a bit more in diameter. But that's a great size. And I'm also going to just sort of unwind this a little bit so that it's sort of, I'm trying to get rid of the coils. I'm trying to get rid of the coils. Okay, so that it's nice and straight. And then I might even like sort of pull it carefully through my hand. I don't want to like, I don't want it to cut my skin. Okay, so just be careful because it could cut your skin if you do it too hard. And then I definitely have to get the end nice and straight. So I'm pulling it nice and straight. Then I get my marker. Like this. And I'm sort of looking this and I'm going, okay. All right, around I go. How many times? It's a good question. It's a good question. How many times do I do this? Um... Do I use the entire lot? Hmm. I might try and use the entire lot, okay? I'm not sure whether that's the smartest idea. 
but I am I'm, I'm, I am going that way I don't have to cut it it's gonna be quite a big coil though mm-hmm and I want to try and extricate it off the off the pen I've done it quite tight because I want a tight coil but that makes it difficult to remove because of friction so but I'll get there maybe I'll let it sort of like unravel a tiny little bit wiggle it a little bit there we go oh, I do have it off whoa that's a thick coil oh I'm not sure whether that's going to be good or not hmm what you can do now is you can bend the wire Oh, I think this is going to be too long. I really think this is too long, too long. Yeah, it's going to be too long. Okay, change of plans. Change of plans. Oh, my suggestion is, my suggestion is that we cut this wire in half and that way someone else can use, okay, so someone else can, well, you might want to make a second coil or something like that. So now I have the challenge to unravel it. Now it is important not to pull it tight, okay? Because you'll end up putting knots in it and you do not want knots in this wire. Just show a little bit of patience, okay? Show a little bit of patience and try and untangle it without putting knots into it because knots are not nice. Knots are not nice. <laughs> So what that means is I need a pair of scissors because I've decided that I actually want to cut this in half. Okay, so I'm going to cut this in half. So it's only going to be 50 centimetres long. Let me get some scissors. And, and you can cut this wire just with normal scissors. Okay, so now I've got two pieces and I'm going to make the motor from just one of them. Okay. First thing you should do is remove this, remove the enamel from the last... I don't know, three centimetres, three centimetres or so of each end of this wire, okay, the last three centimetres. And I like fold it in half and I pull it towards me. Now you might say, oh, why didn't he just edit out that last couple of minutes where he used the meter? Well, I guess I want to show you that I don't have all the answers, you know, and I try things and if it doesn't work, I try it again. I don't think it's great to present to you the, the perfect final product. I think it's important that you see some of the struggles that I go through as well with equipment, some of the issues that I have, and not present some fake, you know, everything so easy um, view, because everything's not easy. Most things are really hard especially when you're making things. It's very hard to make things. That doesn't mean you shouldn't. In fact, you appreciate things a lot more when you actually start trying to make them. It helps you appreciate the world around you more, especially the, the things around you and see what, you know, the wonderful design in nature and how it all works together. When you make things yourself, you actually appreciate it a bit more. So I'm going to, I'm not going to wrap it around as tightly this time because remember I couldn't get it off before. I'm going to go a few times on one side of the wire, on that wire sticking out, and then a few times on the other side. And I think that might actually hold it in place a little bit. Okay. It's easier to come off this time because there's less loops. Okay, it's easier to come off because there's less loops. And I've got it. It's a much easier coil to handle now. Much easier coil. I don't want it like spring, springing out everywhere. So I'm going to take that end and I'm going to use it to tie that coil a little bit together. Okay, so, I've, and then the other side, what I'm going to do, exactly 180 degrees on the other side. So I'm going to use the other leg 
to tie it as well, just by sort of looping it around the metal. And you know what? I actually think I've come up with a nice coil that's holding together. It actually does seem quite nice. Look at that. Oh, so it's possible to get it. It's very important to get a nice symmetric, nice coil. I really like that. And where's that sandpaper? I'm going to just make sure that whole leg is nicely sanded. Okay. Beautiful. So that's our rotor. That's the part that is going to spin. It doesn't need to be nicely symmetrical. See that? It has to be nicely symmetrical, nice and tight, not all boing around. Okay, and I'll, you've got the back black ground there so that you can see it a little bit better. So it's gonna spin like that, so it's important that it's able to spin easily. Now, you get your motor, and we're going to make what are called the, um, well, are they called the bearings or the brushes? There are, but basically, if this is your piece of wood, it's got some two little holes, we want to push that wire through and have a little bit of a loop like that. So this one here, push through and have a bit of a loop like that because our rotor is going to sit, our rotor is going to sit there. Now I've done it too high off the, off the ground because we're then going to put our magnet here and remember we learnt that the magnetic field decreases a long way away from the magnet so we actually want the loop nice and close to the magnet. Anyway, let's have a go. I will. <clears throat> What shall I do? I'm just gonna, I'm just, I'm just gonna put a, put a little loop. That's what I'm gonna do. There we go. It's quite bendable, and if you make a mistake, I'm sure you can bend it back. But I've just put a little um, loop in the wire, and I'll poke that through. Try not to poke your skin or into your finger, because that would hurt. So I'll poke that through. And then I'm looking at what height to sort of bend it off. I'm going to bend it off about there, actually. And so I bend the, the bottom, and then I can do a little bit. It's very malleable, so don't be too concerned about the exact final thing, because you can actually move it around pretty um, what's the best way for you to see this? <laughs> I'm sort of like going, what's the best way? Oh, that looks not so good, but it will probably be better when I put it on the table. So here we go, I've popped it on the table there. And then I need to have another one. So, put a little loop in it. Pop it through here. Now, if for some reason I can't get mine going, that doesn't mean you can't get yours going. Don't try and limit yourself by my capabilities. All right? You, you keep trying. Okay, you keep trying. It, it is possible. It is possible to get a spinning motor with this gear. I promise. And I really hope that I can get one happening today as well. So I'm sort of pushing it so that it's all sort of, sort of sits here a little bit. And I'm going to now pop my rotor in without bending. And, ooh, that's actually not too bad. There's a bit of movement and that sort of thing, which is not great. Um, but I'm actually getting some spinning happening there. So I might just try and... Just do a little bit of bending so it spins a little bit easier. Okay. I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to try. So now get the super magnet. It's very important that you get the super magnet out. And you put that under the coil. Okay. Under the coil like that. And I'm going to get my battery pack. 
with my two alligator cli clips. Okay, my battery pack with my two alligator clips. And that gets connected to one of the brushes. So that's the one that's coming under here like this. And the other one is going to get connected to the other brush. So under here like this. And as soon as I connected them, I actually saw a little bit of movement. It's actually my mo. I think I've got a spinning motor. Look, look, yay! It's not not fantastic. Woo! But it is definitely working. It's spinning. Are you able to do it as well? Just moving that down there a little bit. You know what I could do to make it even stronger? <laughs> Get another battery pack in series. Ooh, let's see what happens. Double the voltage, double the current. That's Ohm's law for us. Get a little bit of a spin. Come on. <clears throat> what if I bring it a little bit closer to the magnet? Will that make it work even better? We do have a short circuit though. Oh, so we do have to be a bit careful that we don't make the batteries go too flat too quickly. Please, please, I'd love to be able to, like, you know, how long does it have to spin for before we're saying it's successful? Five seconds, 10 seconds, one minute? <coughs> Excuse me, you can, you can decide that for yourself. Hopefully I haven't, like, cooked my, cooked my batteries. I think maybe I have. Are you having success? Are you able to do it? I think... I think I'm allowed to say that it it did work. Well, I think I'm allowed to say that. So, has it worked as well as I'd like it to have worked? No, no it hasn't. But I would like to say that it has worked. So, okay, well, I might leave it at that since my motor did clearly spin, not as long as I wanted it to, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that you will have more success. And maybe maybe if you put it on some plasticine, like it was a little bit more stable, a little few more adjustments, make that a little bit more carefully, um, try a few different things, and maybe you can have even more success than me. All right, I'll see you next lesson for our final lesson number 10. See you soon. our last lesson. Lesson 10 of the Understanding Electricity course. Power! <laughs> now, do you recall, I think from lesson one, what energy is? Well, energy is anything that causes change. And there were nine forms. Um, heat, light, sound, electricity, kinetic, nuclear, Gravitational potential, elastic potential, and chemical potential. Now, we're going to be looking at a thing called power. And power and energy and work are very closely related. So, if I'm going to lift, well, if I'm going to lift up this um, mass, this, this uh, motor, I've got to do work on it. I've got to exert energy, and I do work and I, I'm actually giving it some gravitational potential energy. And if I release it, ouch, that, that actually gets converted into kinetic energy. Now, I can do that work slowly, 
if I was a real weakling, or I could lift it up quite quickly. Um, you know, someone who's quite powerful could lift this up really, really quick. Someone who's not very powerful, a little bit of a weakling, it would take a long time to lift that up. Power is the rate at which work is done. Power is the rate at which work is done. So if you can do the work quickly, you're powerful. If you take a long time to do the work, you're not particularly powerful. Now, if you get out your motors, your motors are not particularly powerful. You know, this cannot lift a heavy weight um, very quickly, but we can actually work out how much power these motors have. And as it turns out, the perfect weight to lift up is actually one of these red speakers. These red speakers are a perfect weight. Now you will need to find yourself some cotton string, some cotton thread. Uh, this is like sewing string, sewing thread. It has to be quite thin, okay? It has to be quite thin and I'll explain why. What you need to do, and you probably need about a meter of it, okay? About a meter. What you need to do is cut it and then with your motor, you probably need to wrap it around, I don't know, and closer to the, to the black end than the silver end, but wrap it around a few times and then just like tie it off, all right? So wrap it around a few times and then do a couple of what we, I used to, well, I call them granny knots. Um, I'm not sure why they're called granny knots. Maybe they're so easy to do that you can do them with like tired eyes and that sort of thing. So wrap it around a few times around the, the string a few times and then tie off the string like this. And so you'll have a piece of stringing ha hanging off, a piece of stringing, a piece of string hanging off your motor like that. And I might just like snip the end just to make it nice and tidy. So I've got a piece of string hanging off there like that. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie it the end of the string to the loudspeaker, like this. So what way do I want it? Probably like this, because we're going to use the motor to lift the loudspeaker. Yeah, like a crane. Probably more like a winch, actually. And not, a, not a crane, probably closer to what I'd call a winch. So I've tied that off. There we go. It's got a little bit of weight on it. And so, can you see the, the motor um, it's dangling the, um, the speaker? And if the motor turns, that will wind up the string and the, and the um, loudspeaker will go up. So, I'm gonna use this uh, to place my motor on, okay? Put, place my motor on there like that. I'll need a battery pack to power the motor and I might put a push button switch a push button switch because that you can turn on and off nice and easily and then I think it might be easiest using the old alligator clip lady things clip one there one there and then I'll clip it to the motor so clip to the motor well, that, that really goes nice and firmly when you clip it in from the bottom. That's not coming off. That's fantastic. And now I can lift this up to the top of my polystyrene. Hold the motor there. And if I press the button, woo! Did you see that? Lift it up. If I pull it down, it will go down again. Press the button, up and then down. Oh, up, and then if I press the button, or let go of the button, it goes down. Up, and then down. Up, and then down. <laughs> so I'm using my motor to lift, woo, using my motor to lift the, it's quite fun actually. Actually, the motor's probably more powerful than I thought it was. 
Woo. Are you able to do that? It's quite fun. All right. What are the energy changes taking place? Well, chemical potential energy in the batteries to electrical energy in the leads to kinetic energy in the motor to gravitational potential energy in the loudspeaker as it lifts up. Now, how much work is actually done? Now, work is equal or calculated by force times the distance. Now, the force required to lift this, the force required to lift this is equal to its weight, which is mass times gravity. And the distance is the height. So the work done is equal to the mass times the gravity times the height. Now, what is the mass of the um, loudspeaker? Let me tell you. I've got a little scales here that I can calculate it on. Not calculate it. I can just measure it. So put that on there. The mass is actually 60 grams. So the mass is 60 grams. Now I have to turn that into kilograms. So that's actually 0.0. Oh, I've got to get this right. 06 kg. The mass is 0.006 kilograms. Um, gravity, do you know what gravity is on Earth? 9.8. Gravity on Earth is 9.8. That's to do with the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth. And the height that we're lifting it through is basically the height of that box. So, which is, let me do my ruler, approximately 32 centimetres. 32 centimetres. So the height equals 32 centimetres which again we need to convert to meters. So 32 centimeters, that's easy, that's just 0.32 meters. And so the work done is equal to 0.006, that's the mass, times 9.8 times 0.32 equals, equals, I can't do that in my head. Okay, there's the, there's the little formula sheet there, you can pause on that. And I'll get the calculator out and let's have a little look. Uh, 0 0.006 times 9.8 times 0.32 equals 0 0.02 joules. 0 0.02 joules. That's tiny. That's 1 50th of a joule. That's 1 50th of a joule, which is not very much. And I've just discovered a little mistake that I made. 60 grams is not 0 0.006. 60 grams is 0 0.06 of a kilogram. Okay? 60, 60 grams is actually 0 0.06 of a kilogram. So let me pop that there. And I'm almost sure that that will bring it to 0 0.2 of a joule. So the answer is not 0 0.02. Uh, 0.2 of a joule, so one fifth of a joule. That sounds better. It sounded a bit small, to be perfectly honest. Um, how much power then did the motor do? Well, I have to time how long it takes the motor to lift it up. And now I've got to get my stopwatch. You can do your own stopwatch, that's fine. And stopwatch, okay. This is all a bit tricky now, but I think I can do it. I think I can do it by myself. Just. Only just, though. All right. There we go. I've got my finger on the button. Okay, that's ready. Set. Go. Oh, no, I have to hold it down. <laughs> and 0.76 of a second. Not 0.76 of a second, so not very long. Not very long. So the power equals work over time. The power equals work over time. So we can do that in a little formula. Power equals the work done over the time 
Now the work done was 0.2 joules and the time was 0.76 seconds. So how many joules per second is that? Let's find that out. 0.2 divided by 0.76 0.2 divided by 0.76 equals 0.26 watts. 0.26 watts. So a quarter, a quarter of a watt. Now this motor here is 100 watts. This motor here is 100 watts. So in actual fact, this motor here is 400 times more powerful than this motor here. That's interesting, isn't it? 400 times more powerful. See this little motor here? This little motor here? I can tell you what the power output of this is by a little a little calculation from some of the values here. It's um, uh, 1.8 watt. This is this little computer fan is a 1.8 watt fan, fan, and therefore that's actually seven times more powerful than this little motor. Okay, another way to calculate power with electrical appliances is to use power equals current times voltage. So another way to work it out in the way that I just worked it out using that fan is equal to current times voltage. Power equals current times voltage. So that's the current through it, the electricity, uh, the size of the current, the size of the electrical current flowing through it, times the voltage across it. Now, we can actually do that when lifting the speaker. We can find out what the current is. Of course, we need then to have our ammeter. Hopefully, the, you've learnt in this course that if you ever want to measure current, you need to have your ammeter. And so I will need to put the ammeter in series have to put the ammeter in series with the circuit to, in order to measure the current. So I need the current to go through the ammeter. And I'll pop him up here. Come up here, motor. And the important thing for me to measure now, the important thing for me to measure, is the current of the ammeter when the motor is turning. So I'll face the ammeter towards myself so I can read it. And I'll click the button. Way! I can actually see that quite well. It's not 0.4 amps. Okay, it's it's not it's not 0.4 amps. That's all there is to it. I can read it. Yes, that was good. Can you read your ammeter? So in this case, the current is not 0.4 amps. And the voltage, ah, now I've got to get the other meter out. So the voltage, let's get the voltmeter out. The voltmeter has to be clicked across the motor. You've got to click it across the motor. That means one of the wires has to click on one side of the motor. It's measuring the electrical pressure across the motor. That's what it's doing. It's measuring the electrical pressure across the motor. Oh, I've got wires everywhere, but anyway, all I need to do now is get the value of the voltage across the motor when I'm lifting up the lifting up the speaker. So now, now I'm just looking at the volt the volt the voltmeter. Okay, I can do it. Here we go. Boom! Oh no, it went the wrong way. I clicked it in the wrong way, and, and it was going backwards. Ah, what a pain. All right, there we go. Now it's clicked in, hopefully correctly, and I'll be able to read the value. So, ready, set, boot. Boom. Oh, let's try again. Okay, oi. Well, not too surprisingly, but it's three volts. It's three volts and I'm not surprised by that because there's only one load and the, the batteries are three volts. So that is not surprising at all. 
So the power into the motor, according to the current and the voltage, is 0.3 times 3, which is equal to 1.2 watts. It's using 1.2 watts or 1.2 joules of energy per second of electrical energy, 1.2 watts. But the power output is only 0.2 joules per second or 0.2 watts. That means it's using six more, six times more power as it's putting out. It's an extremely, what we call, inefficient motor. Very inefficient. Most of the energy is actually going into heating up the motor. Um, as the electricity travels through the wires in the motor, it heats up. So that motor would actually start getting, it would start getting hot when it's lifting that, um, um, when it's lifting that load. But then the question is, um, so how, how does the figure compare to the power output you calculated? Well, the, the input power is like 12 times bigger than the output power. And the reason is because of the inefficiencies. Uh, what's the power input to the motor when there is no load? Well, that's interesting. So when there's no load, that means... Um, that means I might take that load off by cutting the string. Okay, I'll take the load off. And I can actually, I can actually see it here. Now I might reset the circuit up so that you can see it a little bit better. Because I, I think it might be a little bit complicated to see what's going on. So let's just make it a little bit nicer for you to see, just in case you're sort of struggling with setting it up. Um, so to get the current, I put an ammeter on. I connected it to the switch because it's nice to have the switch in there. Uh, that then goes to the motor. Okay, goes to the motor. And I used the alligator clips to go to the motor. That, that clicks in there nicely. That way I could move the motor around no problems at all. And then I came back to the um, batteries. Now that allows me to read the current. And then to get the voltage, to get the voltage, I need to click across, I need to click across the motor. That's the tricky part that people struggle with. Um, and so now when I do the switch, I get a nice voltage. And so the question is, what is the power input to the motor when there is no load? So no load is when there's nothing on it. Well, let's have a look. The current is like 0.1 amp, and the voltage is like 3 volts. So what's the power input when there is... Um, what's the power input when there is... Oh, let's wrap this out. Power input when there's no load. Power equals current times voltage. The current was, ooh, something made a funny noise there. Ooh, I'll hold it up off the ground a bit. 0.1 amp, Oop. 0.1, the voltage was three volts, so 0 0.3 joules per second, so it's watts. So in actual fact, when it's not loaded up, it actually doesn't use that much power, 0.3 watts. But what about if I put the fan on? Let's put the fan on and see what happens. Let's put the fan on and press the button. The current goes up all, all to 0.3 amps and the voltage is 3 volts, so 0.3. So with the fan on, with the fan on, the current is 0.3 amps. The voltage is still 3, so it's 9.9 .9 watts. It's, it's using a lot more power. It's using a lot more electrical power when it actually has to drive the fan. How good is that? Well, that's not that surprisingly because you'd expect it to be having to use more power now because it's actually like harder to turn the motor because it's like pushing air so that's not surprising at all that it's using more power agree Woo. why isn't it taking off because the motor's spinning the wrong way <laughs> i can turn the motor around if i wanted to 
Now, what is the power input of a globe when powered by three volts? So let's find out the power input to a light globe when powered by three volt battery. And I might just use normal connectors now. Let's put the fan and the motor away. Keep the area nice and tidy. Screw the bulb into the fan. Click the click the bulb like so. Oh, look at this. Isn't that nice? Woo! Ah, to know the power input, I need to have the current and the voltage. The current and the voltage. So I'll click the voltmeter across the light globe. Like that, there we go. And so what's the power input to a light globe? Well, what's the current equal to? 0.3 amps. And the voltage is three volts. So it's 0.9 watts. So we would say that this is a 0.9 watt globe. So pretty close to a one watt globe. It's using one joule per second. What about the power input of the red LED light? So all we need to now do is swap the red LED light with the globe. Just test to make sure it works. And reconnect the voltmeter. And I've got three volts. <sighs> barely registering any current, like barely. I can't even say that it's 0.1. I'd have to say that it's like 0.05 or something, 0.05. So that would be um, 0.15 watts. So 0.05 of a amp times three volts equals 0.5, of a watt. Barely any power at all. Uh, because even though it's so bright, it's very efficient. It's not actually changing any of the um, electrical energy to heat, it's actually changing most of it to light. Well, that actually brings us to the end of the course. I really hope that you've uh, enjoyed it. I really hope that you've learned a whole heap about electricity and so that when you come to study it further in textbooks and do examples and uh, that sort of thing, or when you, when you do further investigations yourself, um, that it will make a whole lot more sense to you. So hopefully uh, our paths will cross again one day. And um, if you ever do see me out there in real life land, make sure you say good day. Uh, I'd love to um, find out what you thought of this course. Okay, bye for now, everybody. Uh, all the best with your educations and your futures. Bye bye. <laughs>